How's it going everyone and welcome to No Fun Allowed. Today is a very special episode because joining me today is the one and only Dragna Carta. Hello everyone and thank you No Fun Allowed for having me. It is both an honor and a privilege, good sir. So today, of course, we are going to be talking about Curse of Strahd because you might recognize Dragna Carta from such things as the Curse of Strahd Discord, the Curse of Strahd subreddit, and from the Curse of Strahd hit show, Twice Bitten. So we're going to be talking a lot about Curse of Strahd, and naturally there's going to be a ton of spoilers. So players that plan on playing in this excellent module, do not watch this. But DMs that want added insight and information and just want to hear us talk shop, then go ahead and stick around because we are going to be covering quite a bit. So, Dragna Carta, the question to hit this whole thing off here is, what does Curse of Strahd mean to you as a module? Alright, so, Curse of Strahd is a really interesting and intriguing module because it's situated in a very unique place in the 5e canon. It's obviously like several other campaigns, uh, you know, transplanted from earlier uh, modules or adventures. Obviously, you have the 2E, you've got uh, 3E, and I think there was even a Strahd game in 4th edition. Um, and it's kind of updated for a modern audience. It's kind of this interesting intersection of story and, to a lesser extent, character and exploration, where a lot of other modules tend to focus on combat. And uh, obviously, with Tomb of Annihilation, there's a hex crawl. Um, but Curse of Strahd is very interesting in that the combat itself is not the focus of the module. In fact, a lot of the places the combat is kind of the punishment for getting things wrong. Curse of Strahd is almost this very character-driven, um, mystery-driven, obviously, you know, horror, uh, atmospheric sort of adventure. And I think it's interestingly positioned in that it's somewhat unique in that aspect because obviously there's a big community of support for it. And to me, a big part of why that is is because Curse of Strahd is about this character, Strahd von Zarevich, and the characters of the PCs who come into his land and have to come to an understanding of their role in relation to Strahd and how they plan to escape his domain. And I think that's kind of a perspective that not a lot of modules take, as opposed to, you know, your big heroes go fight the bad guys, go beat the monsters, go do the quest. Um, that Curse of Strahd is very divergent from, and I think it makes for a very interesting campaign and a very interesting experience. Absolutely. It is definitely sort of a motif in a lot of modules and a lot of games, really, where the big bad evil guy is this person who sits in the final room at the final session and has one monologue and then there's one fight and that's it. But Strahd, of course, is more often than not played as not like that. Strahd is normally played as an individual that gets in your face, interacts with the party regularly, and is a lot more charismatic because your players get to know this character a lot more than any other villain before. And it's great, especially because over the course of time, they get to interact with this villain at an early stage in the game where they have no hope of beating him, and then they slowly accrue this power over time. But the thing is, is, you know, when the, at some point, your players hopefully think that they have a chance of beating him. And uh, as we've seen plenty of times, you know, people post all these stories about it, not everyone always succeeds. Not o everyone always is able to get that full story of defeating Strahd. But is defeating Strahd even the real story here? Honestly, I don't think so. In, you know, in those other modules, the goal is complete the quest, defeat the big bad, right? In Curse of Strahd, obviously, that is the culmination. Like, you will almost always get to that point, barring a very few, you know, campaigns where maybe the DM is running for an evil PC and they, you know, take his place or something like that. Um, but in general, every campaign is going to come down to fighting and trying to kill Strahd, but that's not really what the module is about. And I think that if you actually look at the module, there are a number of different ways to approach it that kind of boil down to the four main plot hooks that are offered in the initial chapters of the campaign itself. First off, you have the Mysterious Visitors plot hook, um, in which, you know, the Pastani come and invite the PCs to Madame Ava's tent where they get the Troka reading, and from the very beginning they are there to defeat and overthrow Strahd and restore and save Barovia. This is obviously a very uh, uh, classic kind of Castlevania-style vanquish of evil. It is heroes who know what they're getting into, who have a target and know what they're doing. It's kind of a traditional D&D-style uh, adventure in that respect, but it's about more than just um, completing the quest, because a big part of Curse of Strahd is the focus on Barovia as a place that has been corrupted and touched and darkened by Strahd. 
And so the fight in general is about purifying and restoring Barovia as you go through it and seeing all the connections and the corrupting touches that Stratus had on it and finding a way to cleanse those in a final triumphant moment. Obviously, the rules is written epilogue in which Strahd returns kind of weakens that. But again, that kind of plays into the Castlevania idea where you always need heroes to rise up and save the day again as evil keeps recurring. Um, so that's one way to look at it. Absolutely. I think, mm -hmm. I think uh, the second one of, I think there are four ways to approach it, is kind of uh, summed up by the werewolves in the mist opening, where you are mercenaries or adventurers who find yourselves chasing werewolves and find yourselves in Barovia. And this one is about, you know, obviously because you don't start off with the Taroka reading. And in fact, the other three ones, aside from the first, do not start with the Taroka reading, uh, which means that it is not, from the start, this kind of heroic story. Um, so the werewolves in the mist, where you're just adventurers who find yourselves in Barovia and have to find a way to escape and learn about it, it's about surviving and triumphing in this darkened, shadowy land of dangers and uh, undead evil. It's about learning to rely on yourselves and your teammates. It's about learning to make connections with those around you. It's about forging relationships with allies, and it's about, you know, coming together with this information and realizing what you need to do to escape and then triumphing in this final, you know, victory of survival and kind of asserting yourself above Strahd's corruption. That's the second way to look at it. That's uh, kind of a uh, still on the little edge of uh, traditional D&D type storytelling, but it's a little bit diversion because it's still more about, you know, it's less about defeating the big guy from the start and it's more about kind of defeating the bad guy as a byproduct of your own efforts and your own investigations. Um, the third kind of story you can tell is about focusing purely on the healing and restoration of Barovia. Um, this is kind of well summarized by the plea for help hook in which you are drawn to Barovia in a way that immediately hooks you up with uh, Irina and Ismark. Um, and in a way that will obviously begin bringing you around Barovia to say the Marta Cubs and Velaki to um, the abbot in the Abbey of St. Markovia, kind of seeing the ways in which Strahd's influence has corrupted and harmed its inhabitants and finding ways to restore that balance. Um, and this is probably the approach that is least well served by the Rules as Written module because, of course, Strahd does eventually return. Um, but a lot of community modules, uh, such as uh, Mandy Mods or My Fanes, where restoring the Fanes permits Strahd from returning, or um, a number of community editions, uh, I'm working on one as well, um, that it involves Irina be able to permanently escape uh, Barovia altogether, as opposed to you know going with Sorgain to the pool, I like um, or even or even just going with Sorgain to the pool in a way is a kind of symbolic of finding a way of purifying Strahd's touch on Barovia, and I think that's one other way you can look at it, where you are not just vanquishing Strahd, you're not just surviving yourselves, but you're finding ways to actively restore Barovia to this place of beauty and glory and light. And I think that's what a lot of community uh, content is trying to do. Um, because the ending, as written, is not very satisfying for a DM who likes that sort of, you know, uh, kind of thematic storytelling kind of approach. We, we, like, we tend to like things to be a little more lasting than that. Um, and then the final approach you can take is kind of summarized by the Creeping Fog Hook, where you're not connected to Irina, you're not connected to, you know, the werewolves, you're not connected to Strahd or Ava, you're just dropped in this hostile dark land and you don't know what to do. And from there, Strahd is an active antagonist, but it's up to you to find your way around and find a way to survive. And I think that this actually gives, you know, I've written about this as an essay, in an essay of mine and Twice Bitten is kind of the culmination of a thought experiment to prove whether this approach is feasible. But this approach views Barovia not as a place to be um, survived, not as a place where evil is to be vanquished, and not as a place to be healed, but rather Brovia in this approach is a crucible. It is a place where individuals are brought to see if they can survive its trials. It is a proving ground that can force or help uh, individuals to rise and become heroes out of necessity and opportunity rather than being heroes and, and mighty warriors to begin with. And I think this is kind of the most powerful because you know, obviously this is a horror module. So at the lower levels, if you run the horror completely straight, it is all about scaring the PCs, making them feel alienated and isolated and alone. And for, obviously that's not really helpful if you've got, you know, a paladin over there who's doing things for Bahamut and you've got a dwarf mm -hmm. cleric who doesn't take things seriously and you've got a, a bard who just wants to, you know, hit up everyone in the tavern. <laughs> but if you actually have a focus on 
these PCs are people. These are actual individuals that are responding reasonably without, you know, cocky self-assuredness, uh, without, you know, feeling like, you know, their spells or attacks or abilities will make everything okay. People that react naturally to horror and over the course of the module as they are forged by the trials that they have and kind of forced together by Strahd's predations, they are forced to confront the fact that they must become heroes or die. And I think that's a v potentially a very powerful message. It's this very classic uh, hero's journey kind of tale where entering this dark underworld is a forge that turns you into the hero that allows you to return home having completed your maturation. And I think it's a very powerful theme for players and a DM who are very interested in character over story. Because in the end, in this kind of scenario, it doesn't matter if Barovia is healed at the end or not, if Strahd is permanently dead or not. Because the point, um, as if, you know, look at, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, for example, the point is not that the White Witch is defeated. The point is that the Pevensey children are now kings and queens of Narnia. As characters, they have grown and matured and learned and become stronger. And at the end of the day, in this kind of thematic hook, what matters is that when the PCs leave Barovia, they are now the heroes they were always meant to be. It doesn't matter if Strahd comes back, because remember, Barovia is made up of soulless people anyway. But the PCs have completed their arcs and won something greater than just vanquishing a foe they vanquished the demons within themselves and i think that's a very powerful idea well unfortunately the uh the the one time i got to play curse of strahd um my character actually ended up becoming the dark lord of barovia but that's a whole another thing right that sort oh, uh, of <laughs> <laughs> yeah it depends on the I, I personally like the into the mist one I, that's one i run and that's the one i got to play as and i really like the idea of people that are just people having to step up into a world that they don't know and trying to survive the day-to-day -day minutia of the horrible life in the lands of Barovia. And that is definitely something that I love to see my players go through as well because they are just normal people and unfortunately they find themselves in a situation that they don't know is going on and they have to go out and explore around and they, like you said, they don't approach it in the sense of, oh, we're the big damn heroes. They more along the lines go on the approach of, oh, we just want to survive. And definitely if you're running it more as intended, where your players arrive in the village of Barovia first, they really get hit over the head with the fact that their mission is dire, and in fact almost not possible, because if they witness the March of the Damned, all of those previous adventures just like them, all the hundreds if not thousands of people before them, just like them, die. You know, what makes them think that they're any better? And discovering that story together of why are they any better than those previous ones is, for me, the most exciting bit of the entire campaign. And For sure. And, you know, along the lines of all that, you know, we were talking about, like, what is, be, you know, all these beginnings to Strahd and what is the true story here. You know, the beginning of the game is you know, all fleshed out in regards of how you arrive there. And then the middle of the game is what you do when you arrive there. And the ending is what happens at the very end. But what do you typically expect out of your game in regards of, is there certain themes that you want to put across? Is there, uh, you know, ideas that need to be pushed on your players? Is there locations that they need to go to at certain times? Is there a certain, you know, necessity to things when you run your games? Mm -hmm. So I think there are a few ways of looking at this. I think thematically, of course, you know, there are certain universal themes that we would always expect in a Curse of Strahd campaign. There's horror, there's secrets and paranoia. Um, obviously, themes of abuse uh, are very prevalent, although obviously you should definitely dial those back if you have players who may be sensitive to those topics. Uh, there are topics of tragedy and corruption, of this creeping darkness inside your heart. That kind of, and all of these together kind of give rise to this very romantic uh, thematic ideal. Not romantic as in, you know, love, yeah. but romantic as in the period of romanticism that gave rise to uh, the gothic aesthetic and gothic horror as a genre. This idea of primality and emotion uh, triumph and individuality triumphing over this idea of the enlightened intellectual self. And I think those are all very important things to, that can be very helpful for a DM to focus on. Um, and, you know, still thematic wise, I think that, you know, some themes that I specifically enjoy focusing on um, are things, you know, like maturation. Um, who do the characters become because of their time in Barovia? 
um, reclamation of self. Barovia is a place where corruption can happen, but it's also a place where uh, people who were lost in darkness can refine who they were before or refine who they were supposed to be. You can do this even without the Barovia as a crucible uh, idea of cre the creeping fog hook. Um, in my reloaded game, um, I had several players. Uh, one of them, the characters, was a uh, uh, a noble who had lost his territory. One of them was uh, an Azamar uh, paladin who had fallen from grace. One of them was a dragonborn cleric who was looking for a home. And like through the, the, the course in Barovia, they were able to find what they were looking for. Not because you know they actually had family in Barovia, but because the the darkness that they were forced to overcome and the opportunities that they found showed them that they had the means of finding the things that they were looking for. The the noble, found, you know, was able to reclaim Argenvastolt. The uh, dragonborn was able to find community amongst the mountain folk. The paladin was able to reclaim his his uh, grace uh, by restoring the symbol of Tasha Petrovna. Uh, things like that, um, I think, are very important. This idea of the darkness as a place where you can find yourself. I think that's a really, you know, good thing that I enjoy focusing on. That obviously, if you're not overly interested in character storytelling, you don't need to, but I find it very interesting and really rewarding. Um, and obviously collaboration uh, in the specific sense is a theme that I think is very helpful because Curse of Strahd is not really the kind of module where you can go it alone, yeah. um, at least not for very long. <laughs> so obviously, you know, especially if the PCs are strangers at first, they're going to be a bit divergent, but I think it's very important to, and or at least very helpful to create opportunities to push those characters closer together. And I think as far as, you know, your, the second part of your question, specific locations or beats, you know, obviously, you know, Curse of Strahd, if you look at this, like, web of plot hooks and locations, um, if PCs enter from the eastern side, they go through the gates, they go through Barovia, they make their way up past Ravenloft to Velaki, and then from there, this, like, this, uh, this spoked wheel of locations and sandbox opens up to them. Um, and they can, you know, have a lot of freedom and flexibility in where they go. You know, a lot of parties may never go to Berez or certainly not the Werewolf Den. Um, but honestly, I don't think that there's anything essential to be running Curse of Strahd. If anything, I think that the important thing about Curse of Strahd is that it is so full of potential. And frankly, that's something I find fascinating about the idea that the book recommends in two of the hooks, Werewolves in the Mist and Creeping Fog, where it suggests actually starting the PCs not on the eastern side by Barovia, but on the western side by Kresk which I feel would make a huge impact on the campaign because you're not starting with the same lore, you're not starting with the same stakes, you don't even know what the significance of your new location is, and the first settlement you go to, Kresk, turns you away. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of opportunities for really interesting explorations of Curse of Strahd because I feel like part of the reason this module is so popular and has such long-staying power is because it's not a story, it's not a message so much as it is a medium. And there are so many different ways for this medium of Barovia and Strahd's tragic fall and the PC's time in Barovia to be, there's so many ways for those elements to be expressed and explored. And I think it's a big reason why, you know, I don't think any part of it is necessary. I think all of it is, you know, I wouldn't say a grab bag so much as the important thing is not which, you know, uh, locations the PC set up along the way, but what their emergent experiences are like and what the emergent gameplay is like. And I think that's really the 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 central treasure of Curse of Strahd. Absolutely. There's a lot of things you can touch upon. And you talked about this uh, for a little bit here, but interweaving your characters into the campaign itself. While in most campaigns, you try as a DM to try and weave the characters' backstories and their motivations into the world, I feel like a lot of times that is a little bit harder for some DMs to do because, you know, Straw, specifically Barovia, is out in the middle of nowhere. No one's ever been here. They'd have no understanding of what this place is. So you talked about how the noble, of course, you know, went to Argen et and et etc. et cetera. So do you feel like it is absolutely necessary to try and interweave the character into the campaign and more along the lines of, does the campaign come first before the character, or do you try and, you know, make the character for the campaign? So those are really good questions, and I think it ultimately comes down to who your players are and what they want and what they're comfortable with. Because not all players, I mean, something that I do myself is I kind of divide players into two, although I guess maybe three groups. Uh, you have actors, which is, you know, what I'm very fortunate enough to have on Twice Bitten. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, which are players who, um, you know, obviously they're not professional actors, but 
they are here for the character. They play because they love seeing the characters and the characters' growth and the characters' relationships and their conversations and interactions. And it is the characters that provides the lens through which the players remember the story. Um, on the other hand, you might have players who are what I like to call controllers. They view their, they control their character as an avatar. The character is the lens through which they view the story. And they might, you know, get very bored or frustrated with, you know, extravagant character interactions that don't actually advance the plot. But they might love it when, you know, Strahd is defeated by a Divine Smite, or when there's a great big reveal, or when one of the PCs, you know, uh, in the case of my Reloaded campaign, when the Fallen Asimara uh, regained his uh, angelic wings. That was a big moment. And your player might like those big developments in story that really drive them forward. Um, and the third kind of uh, player, obviously, is someone who is interested in... I don't really have a clear name for this kind of category, but this, the idea is someone who's interested in playing D&D as a way to enjoy a game. They're not there for the story, they're not there for the characters, but they are there to enjoy the experience of, you know, participating in this experience, uh, defeating the monsters, vanquishing the evil. It's less about the specific beats and more about the general, uh, I guess you could say, vibe of the D&D experience. And obviously there are subsets of these. There are munchkins and power gamers and, you know, Absolutely. wallflowers and explorers. And we won't get into that. That's a Matt Colville video. <laughs> but um, for the purposes of this, I think, you know, there are a lot of different ways to approach it. And I think if you think your players are very invested in, you know, their characters, then absolutely. I think, you know, bringing those hooks in can be a very rewarding thing to do for them. Um, if, you're, if your players are very interested in the characters for themselves, then absolutely. Uh, but then again, maybe you don't have to, as I've seen in Twice Bitten, and I'm not sure how widely applicable this might be. But you know, if your players are sufficiently vested in their characters, you might not need those backstory elements. They might, if anything, be a distraction from letting your players focus on their characters' growth and experiences purely from their experiences in Barovia. Um, and then on the other side of it, you know, if your character, if your players are just there kind of for the game experience, and they're not really there for the character, and they're not really there for the story, and they just kind of want to enjoy killing vampires, then I don't think you really need that, because at the end of the day, you don't need to hook them there. And while it might be helpful to provide more content, um, it might feel a little bit bloated, or they might just, you know, you know, you know, glom onto it the way that you might hope that they do. So certainly it's an option for, you know, actors and non-controllers, but I don't think it's, you know, necessary or even necessarily recommended. Yeah, absolutely. There's... You know, much like with all these 5th edition modules, there is already a ton of content in there, you know, however many, 200, 300 pages worth. And you can always add more, you can always add less. And you just hit it right there on the head there that it could potentially be bloated. So that's going to bring us into our next topic of how big is this module intended to be? So, you know, the module doesn't give us a clear, okay, you go here, you go do this, you go here, you go do that. They just give us an area and your players explore around. So, you know, your players can do whatever the frick they want. And we'll be getting into all that later on here. But how big should this place be? And more so along the point, how much should you add? You're obviously one of the people in the community that's added just one or two things here. Nothing major, but just a little one or two things. So I, I want to get your opinion on should you add more? Should you add less? What is the perfect sweet spot in regards of all that stuff? Sure. Uh, so I think there are kind of four ways to approach this. Um, while I was prepping for Twice Bitten, I went through the Taroka reading. And actually, something interesting about the Taroka reading is that because of the way it's laid out, it is the campaign is immensely variable. And I think that's, you know, as a side note, one of the things contributing to the module's popularity and long standing success, and that it is so it has so many permutations. Um, that allow us to actually ask this question of how big should the module be and where should the PCs go in the first place. And, you know, one of those possible permutations is a very small scale adventure. It is entirely possible for the PCs to get, you know, uh, Van Richten as their ally and to have, you know, all three of the items located in Velaki. Um, or, and like, you know, get the reading from Esmeralda in Argenvastolt, head back to Velaki, get all the items, uh, get the get uh, Van Richten, and then just ship yourselves down at Castle Ravenloft. It is very possible for it to be a very expedited Castlevania esque, you know, night at Castle Ravenloft style adventure. And that um, would actually they harken back to old school, the the very first Ravenloft, right? Because the original Ravenloft module was just Barovia, the Vistani camp, and then the castle itself. 
And I yes. think I think there is some merit to running it like that, but of course that is obviously the very abridged version of the campaign. Absolutely. I think that is, you know, certainly a very potentially rewarding way to run it. Um, certainly a, a much more clipped way, but you know, even if you do run it basically that way, um, even if the items aren't in one place, even if you have one item at Solanka Pass and one item at the Werewolf Den, and then one item, you know, at Madame Ava's camp, like you still don't need to ever actually go to say the Wizard of Wines or the Amber Temple or Old Bone Grinder. Like even if there are things that are more flung out, you could still be cutting out forty percent of the module. And I think that's you know part of the intent with this module. And you know with this first approach, you know you don't need to hit everything. It's just a matter of what you need to get through. And obviously there are hooks scattered elsewhere, which I'll get to in a second. But at its core, Curse of Strahd doesn't need to hit everything. It is a a list of options, but it is you do not need to exhaust those options in a single campaign. Um, so that's one way to approach it. Second way to approach it is this idea of Barovia as a cohesive setting, where for better or for worse, there's a lot of good content in here, and God damn it, you are going to make sure you milk it for every last drop. <laughs> so you are going to make sure that the players somehow learn about the werewolf den. Uh, you are going to make sure that the players learn about Van Richten's tower. You are going to find a way to manipulate them into going to the Wizard of Wines winery. And if they don't go to Yester Hill, you're sure as hell going to find a way to guilt them into going there and to Berez later. Uh, they're, you're going to make sure they meet Casimir, because even if they never go to the to the Vasani camp on their own, you want to make sure that they get to the Amber Temple, because God damn it, the Amber Temple is cool as shit, and that is a really awesome set piece that you need want to show them. Absolutely. So, like, there's this idea of Crystal Strahd as this very, you know, united, cohesive experience where the players should be exploring Barovia. And honestly, this can feel a lot more satisfying uh, where the first approach, you know, kind of speed levels you. This one, can you can really draw out the milestones and make the players feel like they're really learning and getting engaged in and investing in Barovia. And I think that can also be a very powerful uh, way to form that sort of investment long term. Uh, the third way to look at it is what I've kind of tried to do with uh, Curse of Strahd Reloaded. Uh, and Reloaded basically kind of, you know, I guess minus the feigns, because I have some thoughts about that, but taking out the feigns for a second, uh, what Reloaded tries to do is it starts off with the second assumption, that we want Barovia to be this uh, cohesive piece where everything is interconnected and the players should be kind of uh, ping-ponging their way all around this web before the final battle. And what Reloaded aims to do is, okay, so there's this, but then there's all these places in between where there's opportunities for missing content or other things that could be added. Uh, ways to uh, connect to the stories or connect the hooks or provide alternate options or alternate routes or, you know, maybe there are a few holes in the story or the backstory. How do we fill in those holes in ways that might be satisfying and make sense? Um, or, you know, just fixing some problematic aspects of the module. I mentioned earlier that I'm working on a kind of revamp of Irina's ultimate fate. So I think, you know, that's another way to look at it where Curse of Strahd is a module as a whole, but you're also kind of, you know, taking it one step further by adding these a sort of community tweaks uh, because that is where Reloaded started. It was not actually original work. It was just a compendium of things that I had found on Reddit that I was distilling um, into a coherent guide that I thought, you know, strengthened the overall experience. Um, so I think that's another way of looking at it, where you're not, where you're keeping Barovia as a cohesive whole, but you're filling in the gaps and you're kind of turning up the contrast and turning up the saturation to make it a little more satisfying and deep experience. Uh, and then the final aspect is kind of what Mandy Mod uh, looks to do in uh, Lunch Break Heroes a little bit as well, um, where, you know, Curse of Strahd is this kind of, you know, general area. And, you know, like Reloaded, there are some efforts to fill in the gaps. But beyond that, uh, these kinds of DMs kind of look at Barovia as a canvas. It is a starting point. Uh, but as a DM, obviously, we are not limited to what is on that canvas. We have a painter's tools. Uh, as Bob Ross would say, we can add a few happy little trees. And in many DMs cases, we can add a lot more than that. That's where you get things like the Fanes. That's where you get things like uh, Amber Temple Rituals and combat with Vampire and these big ideas involving the dark powers and, uh, you know, invading, sieging armies. Uh, where Curse of Strahd is this foundational text, but the DM can greatly expand upon it to create a much more uh, advanced or uh, one might say epic experience. And that can certainly satisfy the cravings of a certain uh, niche of DMs and players. Uh, so I think those are the four different ways to approach Curse of Strahd so far as how big it should be. Uh, and I, I know that that was kind of a simpler question and I went on for a really long time, but no, I don't what, think there's any single what, way it should be. That's what the people but... are listening for. That's what we want. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. But yeah, I don't think there's any single way it should be. It's a matter of which one of those DMs you are 
and what you think will be most satisfying to you and your players. Me personally, I don't think, I don't, I kind of personally take Curse of Strahd as, you know, at its edges, and I'm the kind of person who prefers coloring within the lines to coloring outside. Um, so, um, for that reason, I tend to prefer, you know, the reloaded scope or downwards, but, you know, I certainly have a, you know, a, a respect for those who see it as an opportunity to create more. Uh, much as I'd like to be otherwise, I've not, I've never been as much of a creator so much as an editor. So that's kind of what I view my role as, as, you know, compiling reloaded, as opposed to, you know, actively creating new content. But it's uh, whichever you think is most satisfying and whichever th you think your players would enjoy more. Absolutely. I mean, that's what these modules are here for. These modules don't necessarily need to be taken by law. You can, you own it now. You, you buy this book, you buy this module, you own it. Go ahead and change it up because Chris Perkins himself, the man, he constantly says this all the time, change the module. Don't run the same game that everyone else is running. Run your game. The players at your table don't necessarily want to play that game or whatever module it is they want to play your game that's why they're at your table so make the game fit your desires and make it fit for your players desires and run that game as best as you can you know your hopefully down the line when your players are talking about this module for years to come you know they'll obviously talk about the big things such as oh that big fight with strahd or oh that one time we got in a fight with those hags but hopefully they'll be talking about the things that you did that made it special because you made those words come to life. You know, on paper, those three hags at the windmill, they're just three hags at a windmill. But you're the one that gives them flavor. You give them the lines, you give them the combat actions, you make that special. So run your game and, you know, add as much to it or take away or edit in between, do whatever it is to make that game awesome. And Absolutely. And I will just say, sorry if I can cut no, in for a no, second. Feel, like, feel, this is feel not free to come the now. <laughs> Of course, this is not a static uh, decision. Um, if, you know, you start a campaign with a certain paradigm in mind and it comes to, you come to think that your players might not be enjoying it as much as they could, or you see places where it could be improved, you know, talk to your players. Get a better sense of what they're enjoying and what they're not enjoying and see what you can take it from there. Um, I kind of wound up getting lucky when I ran Reloaded for my, you know, uh, Reloaded uh, players. Um, they, I, I was so happy. They, they really, really, they said they really enjoyed it. They said it was a great game. Um, uh, but then I just, they, out of curiosity, they asked me, you know, what it would have looked like without my changes that I had made, um, you know, my tweaks and my edits and that sort and my additions. And, uh, once I described like the rules is written horror module, which is all about, you know, isolation and horror and, you know, fleeing things. Um, they were like, holy shit, we would have hated that. We would, <laughs> we would have quit after like, you know, three months. Um, so like, Know what your players enjoy and see if there are, you know, ways to accentuate or add to the experience to try to give them the game that they're looking for. They might not know what they're looking for up front, but, you know, if you keep that line of communication open, you can very easily reshape the game dynamically and it's not anything to be ashamed of. In fact, it's actually encouraged if you talk about the game outside of game time, one, that helps you better understand your players and better change the game. But two, most important of all, it gets them excited. Because if they spend all week doing nothing and then game time, they finally start playing, yeah, they're playing. But if you talk outside of game time, they are going to be thinking more about the game outside of game time. And that's going to get them more excited for the game. And that's going to get them right and ready to go right when that session starts. And that is an awesome experience. Talking about the game is just rewarding for both you and the players on many different levels. And understanding what they want, understanding what you want, and making the game how you desire and how they desire is going to make this module fan freaking tastic. So, in, you know, going along that theme there, we talked a little bit about, you know, the themes that are permeating throughout this campaign and, you know, how big or how small this campaign can be. So let's go ahead and combine those two. How long should, should certain themes go for? in regards of the isolation, in regards of the horror, in regards of, you know, should this game evolve over time or should it have one current theme throughout? You know, what is, how do you weave this story over the course of time? Of course, I think that there are a few different ways to look at it, that you can kind of boil these this evolution down to. There's the PC's relationship with Strahd. There's the PC's relationship with each other and themselves. There's PC's relationship with uh, their the NPCs around them, and there's the overall stakes of the campaign. 
obviously the PCs relationship with Strahd should not be static. The book says that Strahd torments them and tries to explore, uh, you know, which of them might be suitable. And at some point, the book specifically says he will decide that they're not suitable as his successor or consort and will get tired of them. Uh, and at that moment, their relationship changes. There are other points for change, such as when Irina uh, goes into the Pool of Kresk, or when Esmeralda joins the PCs at Van Richten's Tower after fleeing Castle Ravenloft, where, you know, Strahd gains new goals. And I think that uh, this should be a central driver of the module because at any moment, something that I've learned in Twice Bitten and just in general is if you feel that the momentum of the story is lagging, Strahd is an incredibly helpful tool for redirecting and refueling that momentum. And I think that it's important to keep introducing new aspects of Strahd, new capabilities of Strahd, new power that he might have, um, and just developing and building that relationship, both with the PCs individually and the PCs as a whole, um, to kind of keep things interesting and keep things evolving over time. Um, that kind of ties into the idea of raising the stakes over time, because obviously the start, Strahd is just kind of toying with the PCs. Um, he might introduce himself to them. He might try to you know, get them alone, might try to coax them, might try to corrupt them. Um, and there are a number of different ways to look at it. And this is, you know, that would be the topic of a whole nother video, which is the PC's relationship to Strahd. Uh, but to put it simply, like the stakes should constantly be mounting. It, the PCs should go from, you know, I need to escape, I need to find out where I am, to I need to escape Barovia, to, you know, maybe I need to help my friends, to uh, I need to survive, to I need to live, to Strahd is, you know, hunting me down or is hunting my friends down. And that's not the arc that you need to take, but that could might be a helpful way of looking at how that relationship and those stakes might evolve over time. Because by the time that you get to the finale, there should be this very palpable tension um, in which you know that this is going to be the last uh, time, the last encounter, the climactic battle. And because Strahd has crossed a line and you've crossed a line that neither of you can return from. Uh, for example, in my Reloaded game, the final encounter uh, was kicked off when the PCs had recently finished concentrating the last of the Fanes, and Strahd, who had now decided that the PCs had grown too powerful and that he needed to obtain leverage over them, found all of the NPC families that they had met and befriended and helped over the course of the campaign. And using uh, Bucephalus, using his vampire spawn, using himself, and just, you know, while the PCs were away at the uh, Amber Temple as well, uh, kind of took advantage of that downtime to behind the scenes grab these kids and bring them to Castle Ravenloft and lock them up in the treasury and then send the pieces a very, an invitation saying, come to my castle, give me the artifacts, lay down your arms and I'll let the kids go. And that very clearly signaled, you are in third, you are in the third act. This is your dark low point. The stakes are higher than they've ever been. It's not just about you. It's not just about, it's not just about Velaki. It's about the friends. It's about the children of your friends that you've made and protected and grown to love over the course of this campaign. And when they got to Castle Ravenloft and freed the kids, it was also about, you know, Strahd charming Velakian archers and guards to serve him and kind of this very intricate negotiation where they tried to force Strahd into a position where they would be comfortable fighting him. And from there, the final battle was more expansive and more dramatic and more tense than any combat that they had had before because I'd done my best to kind of pull out all the stops that I hadn't pulled out before. And so I think that this is a very important way to look at kind of the evolution of stakes over time which is the tension should mount and the PCs should feel that the game is growing darker and tenser and accelerating to a point, to a cliff that they can't turn back from. So that's the second thing, and I just spent a long time on that. <laughs> uh, so I'll just kind of briefly talk about the other two, which is character development, you know, for those parties that enjoy it, you know, actors especially, um, and to a lesser extent, story-focused players, you know, character development is really big. Twice Bitten is doing a lot of this, where the characters are growing to trust one another, despite their paranoia and suspicion at first. They're growing to take uh, more active decisions. They're t learning to take more risks, but calculated risks. They are learning to avoid bad decisions. Um, and they are, you know, growing relationships with one another that are, you know, I think very interesting and very productive. Um, and again, that's not for everyone. Uh, this might involve, you know, achieving certain in-character goals, like Again, my Azamar player who regained his grace from his fallen wings, uh, but that sort of thing. And then finally, NPC development is just kind of, you know, I would call this actually like the heart of the game for uh, those DMs and players who really enjoy interacting with NPCs, because Curse of Strahd is not just about Strahd. It's about this colorful cast of characters you meet. It's about, as you know, the Marks of Horror page uh, in the 
uh, preliminary sections of the module tells you, you can't just have darkness. You need to have light as well. Um, and so Curse of Strahd is so strong because there's this recurring uh, indefinite cast of characters that the PCs can meet and keep meeting and growing and strengthening their relationships with. Uh, whether that's Esmeralda, that's that's Van Richten uh, slash Octavio, uh, certainly Irina and Ismark are very core strong characters that can provide a very powerful emotional through line for your players to connect to, especially if they feel that, you know, Irina and Ismark are good people and are doing their best to help the party as well. There's the Marta Cubs, Davia, uh, Irwin, and Danica. For me, I love showing as these very, you know, parental figures for the PCs, providing the safe haven, providing reassurances and comfort so the PCs know they have a place to come back to. That's very powerful. Um, and, you know, as mentioned in my stakes discussion, it's a way of dialing up the heat. Uh, but be, again, be careful of how much you do that. Uh, <laughs> there's, you know, the folks in Kresk. There's, you know, any other recurring NPCs you choose to add. Um, and I think overall, you know, a lot of serial shows, uh, most of Eastern and Western media, are so powerful because of their recurring cast of characters. In Avatar The Last Airbender, for example, there is Zuko, there's Ty Lee and Mai, there's, you know, Iroh. Um, there's this big group of characters, not just of the main cast, but of these recurring faces that you come to know and strengthen your relationships with. Uh, Suki is another in Avatar. And this, this cast of colorful, colorful figures, as these relationships grow, it roots the, the players themselves, not the PCs, but the players in the world, and makes them that much more invested in the campaign if you can make the, these NPCs come alive. Um, you know, not every DM uh, finds that easy. Not every DM, you know, some might feel awkward role-playing NPCs. Um, some might not be interested in that. And that's perfectly fine. But if you do find that something that you're interested in, uh, I think it can be a very valuable and rewarding part of gameplay for those players who are very interested in the story or the characters. Absolutely. You know, tying, you, you said it perfectly, right? Like, there is a difference between what your characters like and think and feel and what your players like and think and feel. And introducing NPCs that you're, players grow to know and love that is going to cement them into the game that is going to make them want to return to these people to talk to these people to fight and maybe even die for these people and you know that really helps cement the locations like all of these cities or the the, the towns right of Vlaki, of barovia of kresk of wherever else that they feed they find all these characters they are going to want to return to these places and that gives you a lot of story beats to work with in regards of what changes over time if your players go from one side of the map to the other you know what is happening in the meantime they're not just sitting there doing nothing all day they are people doing things that could mean absolutely nothing right they could just be having like nothing happen at all to them but of course you as a dm can do whatever the frick you want and you can add so much excitement in the game. When your players return to these characters, they have stories to tell. They have things to talk about. And of course, if you need to pull out that stop, you can go ahead and just have Strahd mess with them somehow. It doesn't necessarily need to be kidnapping because, you know, kidnapping is only one way to mess with your players. You can do so many more exciting things like replace them or just threaten to kill them right there or do whatever the case may be. But that is always something to consider is the prep it's always you always have to consider what you are doing in between your players going out to these various locations and that's going to bring us into our next topic of the session prep is this game a sandbox a railroad or a roller coaster is it a sandbox where your players can go anywhere at any time do anything to anyone is it a railroad where you're trying to direct your players to places a b and c and once they go there they can do options one two and three or is this a roller coaster where your players are going down the track and just having a fun time that you put out? What are your thoughts on, you know, the way to run this game and the best way to go ahead and handle it? Sure. So I think that, um, in my experience, Curse of Strahd um, has been for me the most enjoyable and the, also the most easy to run. Um, when you view it as um, kind of, if you've ever seen a, uh, a chart of, uh, action and tension in movies, for example. They look like these little up and down graphs where they kind of curve up to a peak and then go down to a trough and then kind of curve up to a peak and go up and down like that, um, where the, the tension mounts and then goes down a little bit, then mounts even higher, then goes down a little bit. And I think for me with Curse of Strahd, where you have those beats, right? Those, those moments in time when things change. Um, you need to have times when there is more tension, times when there is less. And when 
the tension is low when the PCs have more choice. I think it's uh, you know important to have those little sandboxy moments uh, where the players can choose from a number of things where they want to go. Where you know, let's say they're in Velaki and they can choose to go to the winery or Argenvastolt or you know the lake or whatever. Um, and there are the those moments of real choice because Curse of Strahd is, like I've said, it's not about the story, it's about the emergent story, the emergent gameplay. And I think it's important, uh, not just for uh, the integrity of the story that your players are creating, but also for the pacing of the game to make sure that things are not always moving at a breakneck speed because your players, out of character, will get exhausted. Oh. So you do need to recognize those opportunities to kind of open the floor up and give the PCs some decisions to make. But with that said, Curse of Strahd is kind of unique in that it's not quite a sandbox so much as a bounded sandbox that has rails laid down connecting many of the areas, but not all of the areas. Curse of Strahd is not the kind of sandbox where you can go to the werewolf den on a whim and then just, just decide 24 hours later, I'm going to go to Old Bone Grinder now. That's not really the way that player mentality works. Curse of Strahd has connections that are laid down, paths that you can follow and expect your players to follow. And there are places where you get to uh, places, you know, hubs where there are lots of spokes leading outward to new uh, hooks or new locations, um, such as Velaki, for example. Um, the Wizard of Wines is notable in that it has connections leading to Berez and Yester Hill. Um, but the important thing to note is that these connections are limited. And you can always influence your players to take one of those paths by mounting the tension along one of those routes. Uh, for example, if your players get to the Wizard of Wines and you know that it connects to Yesterhill and Berez, obviously, you know, it's this bounded sandbox, but your prep does not have to hold it as a sandbox. You don't have to prep Berez and Yesterhill equally because you as DM have the power to conceal or provide additional information as you choose. Um, you have the power to create tension, create additional hooks, to find ways to drive your players one way or another. Um, so, you know, as soon as your players make a choice, if you envision, you know, these sandbox hubs like Velaki as a train station where they can get on any train they like, once they get on that train, they're on that train until they get to another station. Which means that for that time, they should be whipping through the mountains. They should not be forced anywhere, but there should always be something to do. Um, Strahd is very helpful for this. He's a very, you know, as an active character, he can constantly direct, redirect, and refuel momentum. Um, but, you know, there are always things that can happen that can fling the PCs from one place to another because Barovia is, as you said, a living, breathing world in which there's always more going on behind the scenes. When the players return to one place or arrive at a new place, they'll find that there's other things going on. And by if they arrive at a new place, you can, you know, just not mention anything except for the one thing you want them to focus on, not because you're railroading them, because but because that one thing is more urgent than the others, and that's the path you can rightfully predict they're going to take anyway. So I think that it's, you know... Ultimately, you know, when it comes down to prepping these things, I think it's important to remember that Barovia is a sandbox, yes, but it is a limited sandbox. Until you get to Velaki, it is functionally a railroad. You can't really stray off the path except maybe to Old Bone Grinder. And, you know, unless the players are metagaming, they're probably not going to go in there. <laughs> um, and then once you get to Velaki, of course, things open up. But again, there are connections there, and you control how your players receive the information. Which means that if I know my, and you know, talking to your players and knowing your players and knowing your characters is very helpful here. Because if I know that my players are the kind of people who will jump at, you know, a care, an NPC in distress, I can just drop, you know, a, a certain um, plot hook on them and know that they'll chase that plot hook. Um, the other ones are still there in reserve. I can drop them later. But, you know, it's a matter of calculating and choosing where the train is going to take them next. Um, so, yeah. That's the way I view it. Sorry if that's a bit messy. No, no. I mean, that's a sandbox answer, I guess. So, um, absolutely. Like, you you disseminate the information. You decide when it's put out. And the best part about all of the story beats and all the threads that you want to sew is the fact that if you don't do it now, it doesn't matter because you can just do it later. There is nothing... There's no such thing as unused content. You you can always use it later. And that is something very important to specifically this module, right? Of If you want to go ahead and have there be a party at St. Andrews, and if you want there to be a winery getting destroyed by the Druids, and you want to put all these story beats on them, if you put them all at once, then you're putting yourself on a timer and putting, of course, the game on a timer. But you don't have to do that. You could go ahead and just do one of these things at a time. 
and you aren't missing anything by delaying it. You are just simply putting off to later. That's very important to consider the fact that there's a lot of things going on in this module. And as we previously talked about, you don't have to do everything. There's already enough content as is. You don't have to lay out every single quest to them. But it is good to give them those story beats. It is awesome to foreshadow the fact that there is a cave of werewolves. It's awesome to tell them that there is some women that are cooking up some kids. Or depending on how you run the game, whatever the case may be. And that is the next thing I'm going to talk about is the improvisation of this game. In regards of, we, we talk about laying down these tracks, and a lot of the tracks are already, of course, laid out for us purely because of how the map is designed. But how much improv actually goes on in this game? Do you have to sit there and prep for the next session and the next session and the next session? And you down to like minor details, or do you think that the game is more authentic if you don't prep certain things, if you allow things to be more organic? What, what's your what's your take on all that? So I think for me, um, I, I want to start off by saying that I don't think you know prepping more, or prepping less is not you know condemnation. Run the game you enjoy. I don't think it makes it any less authentic if you prep more or less. But I think for me, and what I found is that there are easy, easier ways to prep Curse of Strahd that may be uh, just as productive or just as successful as, you know, more in-depth means of prep. Um, I personally, I've talked about this a bunch on Twitter, uh, I use Sly Flourish's Lazy DM method, where the focus is on the world and the characters and the, you know, things you want them to learn and, you know, some scenes that might happen, but that won't definitely happen. And the goal of that method is to give you a foundation so that it's very easy to work off of. It's like, you know, when you're going into a job interview, like you don't have a script, of, of course, but you are reviewing your resume in depth, you're thinking of things that they might ask you, you're thinking of experiences you've had, uh, activities you've done, uh, projects and, you know, triumphs you've had, so that you know yourself as a person very well before walking into that room. It's not scripted, but you are an expert on the material. And I think that's part of why I enjoyed the Lazy DM method, because it's not about, you know, writing down exactly what will happen when the PCs get here or there. Although sometimes that does come up with more complex encounters. Uh, that's what I did for the Black Carriage Strahd encounter in uh, Twice Bit, where I had, you know, some specific, you know, kind of flowchart-esque ideas of where the encounter would go. But generally speaking, outside of those, you know, big, flashy, certain-to-occur scenes, um, the goal is not to prepare five sessions out or even three. The goal is to prepare for this week and maybe have some idea where it'll go beyond that. You know, maybe have some idea of what things are on the horizon, like if they just get to Velaki, like, I guess be aware of the Feast of St. Andrew and be aware of the Festival of the Blazing Sun. But you don't have to prep it. You just have to know it exists and maybe keep a countdown in your notes or in the back of your head. Ultimately, I think, you know, personally speaking, I don't script things, you know, specific, I don't, you know, I don't like, you know, cutscenes or that sort of thing, unless, again, it's a big flashy scene that I know is going to happen, in which case I'll just read off flavor text either if you're from the book or that I've prepared myself, you know, I'll predict scenes, but I'm not going to write out, you know, exactly what Davy and Mardikov is going to ask them when they get there and what his answers are going to be. I'm going to jot down some things that, you know, you know, or what Erwin Mardikov says. Um, I'm going to jot down some things that Erwin knows, some things that I, you know, will probably want, you know, some information that I want the PCs to have that Erwin can probably share with them. Uh, but I'm not going to script it out. I'm not going to over prep it. And, you know, I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen, you know, two weeks from now. Because right now, because of the focus on emergent gameplay and this idea of Curse of Strahd as a place that can, you know, go from place to place depending on the PC's interests and the PC's current activities, you know, I think that's very helpful for a DM because you don't have to worry about and freak out about predicting everything your players are going to do. Because as long as you're an expert on what's going to show up in your next game, you don't have to worry about writing a script. If you're going to have a special, you know, guest NPC show up, like, you know, Muriel or Rahadan or someone, you don't have to know what they're doing back in Ravenloft. You don't have to know what's going on everywhere else. You just have to know who Rahadan is and what he wants. And I think that's a very liberating way to look at game prep, um, especially in Curse of Strahd, because it's not a railroad. There are rails that can go from place to place, but usually, you know, you don't have to worry about rails that will happen, you know, three stations from now. I mean, personally, there are some ways that you can manipulate the pacing to help help with this. Uh, for example, I always end sessions, my or do my best to end sessions on a cliffhanger. Oh yes, <laughs> specifically, specifically a cliffhanger that you know will provide a good amount of content for the first half of the next session, 
not just because it leaves the players groaning and wanting more, although that's certainly a big part of it, um, but because if I end on a cliffhanger, then I know what's going to occupy the first two hours of the next session. I don't have to prep four hours of content. I just have to prep two. Because I already know from this week what to expect in the next two hours of next week's session. And I think it's a very powerful tool for prep because it, it liberates your time and it lets you be a lot more flexible because you know what's going to happen, but the players don't. And that means that you can just, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, this idea of, you know, the world beyond the gaps, this fog of war, where the players don't know what lies beyond the fog of war. They, they believe that you know everything in the land of the campaign. You know, they believe that you have got everything planned out and scripted. And, you know, to some extent, you might have some things, you know, long term irons in the fire. But for the most part, they're looking at the fog and they think that there's a whole map beyond that. You don't need to build the map. You just need to fill in the things, you know, a quarter mile through the fog and let the rest work, its out, work itself out later. Absolutely. I've I've ran games where I played session by session and I've ran games where I try to plan everything out by session to session well in advance. And what I've discovered is if you know for a fact, okay, by session 15, they will go here and do this. You try to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy. And unfortunately, that can get in the way of player agency. And that can mean that certain things get drawn out longer because you were incorrect about the timing. Or more importantly, I think, is that some things get, you know, sped through because you are trying to meet a certain deadline. And I definitely agree with that whole session to session mentality of, you know, you definitely think that something's going to happen. But at the end of the day, your players are players and they are going to ruin all of your plans and curse them, right? They are going to, you know, throw in monkey wrenches and you've got to deal with it. But obviously that is part of the fun of being a DM, working with what your players give you because you work with what they give you and then you give them something to work with. It is in itself, you know, this autonomous system and it works incredibly well. And, you know, that emergent gameplay that we keep on talking about that is fantastic. You get to work off of what they're giving you and it just works so well. Obviously, you have those ideas in your mind that, oh, next session, they're definitely going to go here and do this, and you prep for that. But, you know, just make sure that you have at least one or two other things cooking on the side. And we talked a lot about, you know, your players going around this world and interacting with all these NPCs and exploring all around. But the thing is, is that this is theoretically a big campaign. This campaign could realistically last in-game days, weeks, months, or maybe even years. Like, you know, talk to Harrison, for example, right? So, time is this thing in D&D &D we sort of forget about a lot of the time. Because we only show up to play a game for anywhere between two to four hours. But our in-game characters are experiencing time incredibly quickly or incredibly slowly. So what do you do to make time flow in your games? Like, what is the generic idea of time going by? And how do you break the daily minutia of everyday life? Mm -hmm. So I think the way that I tend to approach it is, um, uh, basically, if you've studied screenwriting or uh, movies or TV pacing at all, um, there's all the focus of uh, screenwriting is not you know the character's internal monologue. Uh, a book can occupy you with a character's thoughts or memories for pages upon pages, but a TV show can't do that. What matters in screenwriting is what is on the screen. And the thing about what is on the screen is that whenever there's a scene, there must be a dramatic question, which is a question that the audience has in their minds about how the scene that will be about how the scene will be resolved. And the important thing is the audience doesn't know the answer to this dramatic question until the scene is concluded. Um, you know, entire episodes have dramatic questions running through them. Uh, entire seasons can. Um, but each scene in itself has to have some kind of question of, we are unsure how this will end, so let's watch it and see how and find out. And I think that for me, pacing-wise, I tend to prefer, you know, you know, go through the day, right? Describe the... Um, what the players are doing, where they are. Make sure every, you know, minute and hour is accounted for, but you don't need to go through every minute. It is okay if there's no dramatic question to just say, you make your way along the Svalich road. Um, you know, obviously, I would say, you know, if you can, air toward montages, um, instead of just saying, uh, oh, you get to Velaki, 
because you know that makes the campaign feel very disjointed and full of you know fast travel kind of aspects, which can make Barovia feel more video gamey and less real. Oh, yeah. um, but you know, you don't need to spend much more than thirty seconds describing the landscape as they make their way from Old Bone Grinder into the Valley of Velaki to make it feel real, while not bogging the time down. Um, just little touches about you know mentioning a sunrise or a sunset, or I mean not so in Barovia, but you know, <laughs> dusk or dawn. Uh, mentioning, you know, the how the PCs spend the rest of their day while they're just waiting for nightfall to come. Uh, again, not over much, maybe 15, 30 seconds, but, you know, to f make sure that that gap isn't empty, so that the players know what their characters are doing in the interim, uh, and then skipping to the scenes where there is a dramatic question, where we're not sure what will happen, or the characters aren't sure what will happen, or there's something they want to achieve and they might not succeed, uh, or there's something they're going to learn. Uh, and that's where you hand the mic back to your players and say, okay, you travel to Velaki, uh, you made your way through the trees, and I'm, you know, obviously I'm abridging this greatly. In an actual game, I'd you know, give, give more depth here. But you get to Velaki, and then they get to the gates, and as a DM I know, the guards are not going to just let them in. There is a dramatic question here. Can the PCs convince the guards to let them into Velaki, and will the, will the guards receive the PCs uh, you know, with warmth, and will the PCs learn of Velaki during this encounter? And so that's where you hand the mic back to the PCs and, you know, you go into this kind of usual DM uh, player dynamic where I give you the context, you tell me what you do, I adjudicate what you do, you react to it, and so on. And I think that's kind of the important thing to remember about pacing is that if there's not a dramatic question in the current scene, it's okay to skip ahead. Just make sure that the gaps are filled in so your players aren't left adrift or uprooted. Absolutely. There's, you know, that we, we once again, player agency, right? If you just go ahead and say, okay, you're traveling around along the road, is there anything in particular you say or do? You know, just that quick little moment of handing over the mic can generate a ton of buzz. There has been plenty of times where, you know, whole portions of my sessions have been eaten up by my players talking to each other. And that, once again, leads into the emergent role-playing of the game of the players actually talking to each other, especially if they are strangers and getting to know each other better over the course of time them talking to each other is going to one help them cement each other to the world but you can obviously gleam a lot of information from that and go ahead and jot it down to use against them later you know that that's a that's a blast and over the course of time in this campaign your players are going to do a lot of travel you know even if it is they show up to vlaki and they spend half the campaign in vlaki they are still walking around the inside of the place they're still interacting with a lot of the people inside there is a lot of things going on in between the scenes that we play out. And don't necessarily think that your characters are just standing around doing nothing. Always assume that they are at least interacting with the world to some degree. And I kind of wanted to just ask you personally, what do you think is the average runtime of a Curse of Strahd game in regards of in-game days, weeks, months, or years? Because from my personal experience, it has been either weeks or months like traditionally around i think like three months so i think the interesting thing about curse of strahd is you know obviously one aspect of this is the travel distances rules is written everything in barovia is pretty close together um but if you you know double or i've seen some people you know octuple the distances between settlements then obviously you know it becomes much more of a hex crawless experience and the campaign time is elongated by quite a bit um I think, you know, in kind of a rules as written campaign, you know, given everything that you're doing, I could probably see it getting up to a month long, maybe three to four weeks. Um, but I think a big part of the reason why, you know, in most cases, it won't go very far beyond maybe six weeks at maximum is just because, you know, you know, you know, a the content, there's not a huge cohesive amount. You don't need to hit everything, which is why I think in most cases it'll be three or four weeks, um, maybe five. And obviously, if you add other community content, you can get up to, you know, six or seven or eight weeks of content with, you know, the Fanes and the Dark Powers and all that stuff. Um, but beyond that, Strahd is a very ever-present and oppressive force. Uh, the players can't just take a week of downtime. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess they can uh, if the DM allows it. I've heard, you know, stories of DMs who just let their players take a long rest in Castle Ravenloft. Uh, but at least ostensibly, um, there's always a pressure because you are always, you know, under Strahd's thumb. You were always within Strahd's reach and his domain. And I think that prevents a lot of the downtime um, kind of recovery and exploration at this kind of slower pacing that other campaigns can have. 
Um, there's not really a chance in Barovia to go off the grid because Strahd can always find you. And if Strahd can find you, Strahd can make your day terrible. Um, so it's based off of personal experience. You know, again, I think, you know, three to four weeks, maybe five at most for rules is written, maybe six to seven, eight weeks if you, you know, tweak them or expand the module. Um, maybe if you allow more downtime, if you had a lot of new content, I could see it going up to three months, but certainly not more than that. Yeah, my, uh, well, my game experience may vary, but uh, in my current game that I'm running right now, two of the players just got arrested in Velaki for uh, malicious, uh, you know, ill behavior and are have been locked away for 10 days. So that's gonna, you know, there's gonna be some fun things that come out of that. But in regards of that, you, you just talked about it, the timer of this game, the fact that Strahd is this ever-bearing presence that's always, you know, waiting in the shadows... Is this game on a timer permanently, or does the world more or less stop for them? Are they constantly having to complete that quest or something bad will happen? Or do you go ahead and just allow for at least a little bit of freedom in regards of that travel? So I think the interesting thing about Rules as Written is that it provides a number of clocks, um, a number of events that occur off screen. And I think that's kind of indicative of the general experience that a lot of uh, DMs tend to uh, run with. There is the Feast of St. Andrew, where if you stay in Velaki for three days, on the fourth night, um, Strahd attacks the Church of St. Andrew. There is obviously the Festival of the Blazing Sun, the third day after they arrive in uh, uh, Velaki. There is Winter Splinter's attack, where if the PCs leave the Wizard of Wines and come back, um, you know, Winter Splinter has destroyed the winery and the Marduk of Clan has taken up refuge in the Blue Water Inn. Uh, there is Esmeralda, who is all over the map and, you know, Nothing forces her to join with the PCs. For example, they can meet her in the castle, and unless they specifically ask her to join them, she won't, which means that they can meet her in the castle and then later meet her exploring Argonvistolt three sessions later. Um, and I think that, you know, the important thing about Barovia is that there's always something happening. Maybe that doesn't mean, you know, Strahd shows up every night or Strahd is always plotting something, um, but that certainly means that, you know, the, the PCs are not the protagonists of the world. The protagonists of your story but only insofar as the story is emergent from their actions. Um, the clock doesn't stop when they're gone. Characters will keep acting, characters will keep doing things. And I think that's, you know, part of the very real intent of the drafting of the module, like I said, with Winter Splinter and others, where, you know, for the Feast of St. Andrew, even if the players are in Velaki, there's nothing that tips them off to go to the church. Um, I think that, you know, obviously that's pretty huge which is that, you know, this event can happen without the PCs ever being aware of it until it's already happened, even if we're in the same settlement. And, you know, I think that it's a pretty noteworthy takeaway, which is that Barovia is a place where the players are shaped not only by what they have experienced, but by the consequences of the darkness around them upon others, whether or not they were available to prevent those harms. And if they were not, if they chose not to prevent those harms, or they were not available, that can change a character's outlook and decisions in the future. And I think for those reasons, it's very important to make sure that Barovia doesn't feel stagnant, like it's just waiting for the PCs, you know, the righteous heroes to dive in, but to make sure that it's a place where there's always darkness in the places where you're not looking. And that forces the PCs to be vigilant. It uh, forces them to feel a little more isolated and forces them to be a little more proactive so that they're more invested and engaged in the story instead of feeling that they can just unplug when in reality, they really can't. Absolutely, yeah. We, we, we just talked about the Feast of St. Andrew. If your players don't catch up on that and it just happens, then I promise you from then on that they're going to constantly be going around saying, hey, anyone got a vampire problem around here? They're going to be looking around the place because they don't want that to happen again. They only have these few bastions of civilization left in this location in all of Barovia. And they are going to probably do whatever it takes to try and preserve those. And, you know, the Feast of St. Andrew goes on, and then the wines start not flowing anymore. They're definitely going to want to go ahead and try and make sure that the wine keeps flowing in Barovia. And then they have to keep considering all the other things. When they go to the other towns, what is going on? What are the dangers that are endangering their last bits of freedom around here? And how can they go ahead and save the day? And that does lead into that whole aspect of trying to become a hero, whether you're a hero or not, because it's not necessarily that you're doing it for the good of everyone, but you are definitely doing it for at least yourself, because if there is no towns, then, you know, you're just out in the middle of the woods, and that's not going to be great. And 
something that we, we talked about is the whole time aspect of this game in regards of you can either make it so that your players spend a decent amount of time traveling or places are relatively close. Realistically, in the real world, villages were, you know, relatively close together in walking distance. But, you know, we don't think about medieval times anymore. But the whole idea about time is very interlocked with the mechanics of 5th edition. In 5th edition, the idea is that you get into multiple encounters in a day because, lo and behold, you can get into 20 fights in a single day, but it, you can wake up bright and early tomorrow morning and it's like nothing ever happened. So my question to you now is, does 5th edition add to the storytelling of Curse of Strahd? Do you think it gets in the way? Do, do you have to alter your entire game around it? You know, what is what is 5th edition actually doing for Curse of Strahd? So I think the thing about 5th edition is that within the context of Curse of Strahd, because as you said, the design idea of 5e is this idea of the adventuring day. The 6 to 8, easy, medium, hard, and maybe one deadly encounter that wears the PC's resources down over time. Curse of Strahd doesn't do that. It In most cases, the PCs will not face more than one encounter a day, maybe two, and usually one or both of those encounters will be exceptionally deadly unless the PCs are severely overleveled. And I think, you know, this obviously produces kind of a swingy effect where, you know, it's kind of difficult to die in 5e, um, you know, where you have to go unconscious, you get death saves, you might stabilize, etc. You can get brought back up by healing magic, um, that kind of yo-yo effect. But on the other hand, if you are in a lethal situation, it is very difficult to escape not least because players refuse to believe they're in an unwinnable scenario until half of them are dead. Um, so I think that in that respect, there are kind of two ways to approach it. There's um, kind of the, the rules as written approach and there's the reloaded approach. Um, in reloaded, what I tried to do was I made some of the encounters easier and in some places, you know, kept or even raised the difficulty while providing, you know, the PCs with additional tools or means of overcoming those obstacles. Um, I think the archetypal example, I didn't come up with this, but the idea of Walter the Flesh Mound in the Death House basement is, you know, a replacement for the Shambling Mound that is, you know, pretty difficult and deadly, but can be defeated by, you know, slaying Walter at its center. And in fact, getting, you know, swallowed up by the, by the Flesh Mound in this case is, you know, deadly, of course, but it's also the only way to easily defeat it. So there's this kind of synergy of mechanics that, you know, the community has kind of come together to say, this is too deadly. It should still be painful, but it should be winnable uh, in the course of things. So that's one way to look at things. The other way by rules is written is this idea, and I talk about this in my video on the subreddit YouTube channel about t avoiding TPKs through the use of horror, which is you can signal to players when an encounter, when an, a future encounter is unwinnable by leaning on these aspects of horror to discourage them from approaching a uh, an extremely deadly encounter or by relying on, say, uh, an NPC enemy's discretion in deciding whether to spare or fight them or leave them alive. Uh, obviously, Strahd is one example of an NPC that can do those things. Um, but, you know, if you make this kind of social contract with your players such that, you know, the scarier an area is, the more deadly the enemies are likely to find there, you can do your best to steer players away from ever encountering those deadly dangers at all. Um, while, you know, letting them trust, you know, that their sights and senses will help inform them as to how to stay alive. And that's not really the archetypal 5e gameplay, the reloaded approach where you kind of, you know, make things a little easier. Obviously, Kirsch Perkins did that when he replaced the Night Hag Coven in Bone Grinder with Green Hags instead, which are more level appropriate. Um, but I think overall, the rule set kind of is not, you can't really implement it in the same way as you would a normal campaign, unless you either A, change the campaign to be more like a normal campaign mechanically, or B, really rely on those marks of horror to make the game fair and make sure your PCs don't run into a Dark Souls boss and die. <laughs> because unfortunately this isn't Dark Souls where you get free response unless you're running Dark Powers early level. But, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this whole, you know, whether this be hard or not, whether this is like Castlevania or not. So to that degree, does this game fit a more pulpy style like 5th edition where your players are awesome badass heroes that can shrug off death like it's nothing? Or do you think this game deserves a more hardcore hardcore approach where, you know, there is lingering injuries and they are definitely feeling the effects of fights? 
So I think that there are a few ways to play it, and I think it ultimately comes down to what your players are comfortable with. Um, for example, you know, just Castlevania as an example. Let's take the Netflix adaptation, where you know, um, the characters at the start are not able to take on Dracula, but by the end of the story, they are able to. Uh, but they have to take on you know difficult enemies and kind of level up as they go. Uh, but that never kind of loses its you know pulpy heroic feel to it. It never feels hopeless or gothic or uh, grueling. Um, and on the other hand, you have you know kind of the twice bitten aspect approach is which is um, it's about a horror experience. It's about staying alive and surviving. It's about you know avoiding the dangers. Um, but obviously, there's also another place where you know you, the enemies are not as de deadly because you've you know made them easier. You've made things a little more forgiving. You've made the players more powerful. That sort of thing. And these are all legitimate ways to look. I think it depends on what you and your play party will enjoy. Um, you know, if you could, I could divide them you know to three groups off the top of my head. There are again actors, or maybe not actors, but let's say survivalists. Uh, the kind of people who really enjoy, you know, tracking resources in Tomb of Annihilation, um, or, you know, who really enjoy, you know, acting out characters who are wary of things. Maybe they enjoy playing Amnesia or other survival horror games. Um, then there are, you know, uh, experts. You know, in Castlevania, the main characters are not seeking out fights. They are, they are being very careful and they're approaching fights intelligently, but they are, you know, capable of taking on the fights. This is a horror game where, you know, you have, you know, weapons. You have to be careful with how you spend your resources, but you can kill the monsters. Uh, and then the third type is just as kind of like, you know, more casual and relaxed, which is a very valid way of playing the game where the enemies are easier or the players just keep bringing in new player characters whenever someone dies because, you know, the characters just kind of ways for them to experience the game. Um, or maybe the DM pulls their punches because it's just about the experience of hanging out and having a good time. Um, so, you know, it depends on where you think your players land on that scale. And, you know, for new players, I would probably just make things a lot easier. Um, unless your players are, you know, horror buffs or, like, they really enjoy playing horror games. Um, and, like, they love horror movies and they like that aesthetic. Um, or, like, they're really big on that sort of thing. Or if your players, you know, have been are veterans of D&D &D 5e and have been playing for a long time, then obviously you can run it as more of, like, the Castlevania style. But generally speaking, you know, if you're running it for a new or maybe, you know, novice party... Um, I would definitely lean toward, you know, making it easier or making them a little stronger uh, so that they can get the gothic experience, but without the torture. Yeah, that's uh, that's always something to consider whenever you're running a module is your player base. If your players are brand new to the game, you have to not rely on certain motifs that are permeated throughout D&D because your players don't know what they are. You do have to consider the fact that your players are new and maybe not, don't know all the actions they can take. But more importantly, they don't know what the monsters can do. And, you know, that is something you have to sit down and really consider with your player base. Thankfully, if you have only one new player and you have veteran players, they are going to help out the newer player. And thus, you can have a little bit of a mix there. But for as much as we talk about all these new players and veteran players... Something I wanted to cover is veteran DMs or new DMs. There is, you know, every single 5th edition module is written entirely differently. They are not uniform. And to some degree that's okay, and to some degrees it's not okay. But in your opinion, is Curse of Strahd a module that new DMs should pick up and play? So, man, that's tough. I think Curse of Strahd is not an easy module for new DMs to play. Um, because there are a lot of hidden learning curves. Uh, it's certainly something that they can. It can be very rewarding, um, especially if they find, you know, the Curse of Strahd community and they're able to take, you know, advantage of other people's advice or content or uh, or guides or that sort of thing. Um, but as written, if you're just running out of the book, I do think it can be very challenging, um, both because of the difficulty, because of the... Uh, the horror aspect, um, a DM can often pick this up because they're looking to, you know, play a very, uh, you know, foreboding, you know, horror atmospheric uh, vampire and their players might not be plugged into that. This is a campaign where expectations are essential and a new DM might not know to have that session zero or might not think to mention session zero that they want this to be a dark campaign. Because I have seen many DMs who, you know, wanted this to be a dark survivalist horror campaign and their players either fight with each other constantly because they, you know, that's what my character would do and they want to play the edgy loner. That is role play terrorism, players... by the way, saying my, that's what my character would do. Absolute role play yeah, terrorism. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, or um, your players don't take it at face value, where they, you know, they, you know, play comedically. They make fun of Strahd's accent or his big cape, or they call him Batman, you know, things like that. And, you know, I think, you know, those are very important, you know, I guess you could call them DM soft skills, where they're not about, you know, the mechanics of the game or even preparing a game, but about knowing how to in create a, an interface with the game for your players and how your players will interact with that game. Um, and those are very important soft skills that a lot of new DMs don't have yet. Um, and obviously, there are the more mechanical things like prep, because, you know, running like... Curse of Strahd, I mean, I describe Curse of Strahd as a bounded sandbox, where, like, there are places you can go and it feels sandboxy, but it's not. It's really limited. Like, maybe you're in one place, but there are only four places you can go, and the DM can boil that down to two just by, you know, withholding information. But a new DM won't know how to approach that. They won't have the that trained frame of mind for evaluating content. They'll just see this big book of stuff that can happen at places the PCs can go, and they'll, they, I've seen it, they feel overwhelmed. And I think that is a larger flaw with um, a good amount of uh, modular content, uh, which is that more advanced modules don't provide those scaffolding lessons to teach new DMs how to run those more difficult adventures. Lost Minds of Fendelver is damn easy to run out of the book, except for, I guess, maybe the first Goblin Ambush, which is insanely deadly. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, but beyond that, like, it's very... It, it's actually very helpful because if you read Lost Mind of Fendelver, it actually has little tips in the margins. It tells you what to expect, what the players might do, how you might modify things. Um, it has little bits of advice that are very helpful in scaffolding a new DM's understanding. But beyond Fendelver, from what I have read, other modules kind of put the onus of teaching new DMs onto communities of experienced DMs instead of wizards doing it themselves. Obviously, the Dungeon Master's Guide has a lot of very helpful information on, you know, how to create things, how to prep, how to adjudicate. Um, but, like, for example, until, you know, like, we just got Tasha's Guide, mm -hmm. uh, or Tasha's Cauldron, and that, for the first time, has a 5e product officially talking about running a Session Zero. Yes. Yeah. 5e came out, like, five years ago, <laughs> six years ago. And, you know, a Session Zero it was only in official content once the community had created it as this concrete, well-defined thing, and then kept it that way for like four years. Sessions Heroes existed for a long time, and only now is Wizards getting around to talking about it. Um, and it's, you know, it's at the back of a much larger source book that a lot of you players might not read. And I think that, you know, obviously there are production costs, there are writing costs, um, you know, and, you know, Wizards as a private company has to take these things into account, but I think it is a lot of meta-analysis and lot, a lot of meta-advice is failing to appear in more advanced material to prepare newer and intermediate DMs to run it. And I think that is a shame uh, because it is offloading a lot of the effort onto the social media communities of DMs, um, which you know obviously is great for the communities and is great for creating these you know social bonds. But it does mean that a lot of new DMs will either miss these resources or won't think to use them. And they will wind up in situations that are pretty suboptimal. And I think that could be addressed by, you know, having a little, you know, textbook style information panels or boxes in the book, or maybe a little bit about, you know, how to approach prepping this adventure at the start of the prologue. Like little things like that, that could just make a little more, make the user experience a little more friendly to a new DM uh, that just is missing. And I think for those reasons, it can be pretty challenging uh, for a new DM to approach Curse of Strahd. Absolutely. I will say, though, if you are listening to this right now, you're already on the right track of consuming media, at least interacting with the community, because, you know, I've only played and ran through this thing only three times, but Dragon Card has got a little bit of a history. But most important of all, join the discords and the subreddit. There is a wealth of information and not only already present, but you can ask anything and it's going to get a response pretty much within like, what, a minute, you know? The subreddit's only got 30,000 people in it, and they're all chomping at the bits, willing to help people out. Use these resources to your advantage. There is just so many people so active that want to help you out. Go ahead and do it. So Absolutely. And the, if, you, if you don't know, the, just, uh, the URL for the subreddit, the Curse of Strahd community, and if you're new to Reddit, I know that the interface can be a little bit challenging at first, but trust me, it can be very helpful. Uh, the subreddit is uh, reddit.com slash r slash Curse of Strahd. Uh, there's a lot of good resources there, a lot of people willing to help, and it does also provide a link to our Discord community, 
uh, I would highly recommend any new DMs interested in running this module. We have a new DM primer, a new player primer. We have, you know, an introductory guide. We have uh, compendiums of resources. We've got a forthcoming wiki. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff. And, you know, for anyone who's not sure where to start, uh, that's what we're there for. Absolutely. You know, just, I mean, like, it, it's great now that we're finally getting all these Reddits and all these Discords and whatever the frick else. I, like, I know for a fact there's going to be more stuff being created for not just D&D as a general, but even specific for niche things like these individual modules. They are wealths of information. All these maps made for us. All these, you know, ideas that we can plug into our games. And it's just so fantastic that everyone is willing to go ahead and you know put in that time and effort and for some people even money so we going back to i guess uh chris Stroud as a whole here we talked uh just recently about all these encounters that your players are going to be getting into specifically combat encounters but obviously not everything that your players get into that is an encounter is a combat encounter Plenty of times your players are going to find a person and they go ahead and talk. So in regards of that, in regards of your players exploring around and, you know, making their way through the woods or trying to just walk down the road, whatever you consider an encounter to be, how much is left to the roleplay and how much is left to game mechanics when your players get into one of these not immediately combat encounters? I think it can be kind of a interesting situation. Um, the way I like to see it is that the player's role play uh, creates choices uh, that they can take, and the mechanics uh, serve to further restrict uh, which choices they can choose. Uh, for example, let's take the Revenant encounter in uh, the random encounters table uh, on the Svelich Road. The player's role play will determine, you know, how friendly this revenant is, whether they glean the information they're looking for, uh, whether they might find the revenant to be hostile, um, etc. cetera. Uh, and from there, there is, you know, a matter of mechanics such as, you know, can you survive the trek? Um, can you, um, can you, you know, sneak past or persuade Vladimir or, or, you know, things like that um, for, you know, uh, the Bones of St. Andrew, there are role-playing choices that, you know, lead you to um, the Coffin Maker shop. Um, but there are mechanical uh, implications that, you know, check, you know, can you proceed down this path or are you going to be successful in this effort? Um, and so I think, you know, Curse of Strahd is kind of the purest implementation of this idea of the player presents a scene, the, the, or the DM presents a scene, the player presents a choice, the DM presents an adjudication, and the player presents a response, and then the whole process repeats. You know, in another module, there's a big focus on you know the story or following the story or going from point A to point B. But in Curse of Strahd, because of that emergent gameplay, the utter the the focus is where your players seek to go, and then are they capable of going there? Um, and the capability might involve taxes on their resources, and might involve you know locking things off. But because nothing in Curse of Strahd is essential. Like, you don't have to sneak past Fiona Vokter to get the Sun Sword in her closet. Um, you could also just, you know, break your way in. Um, there are a lot of different options here. And I think that, you know, ultimately that's what I come down to, which is the players through the role play and through the characters create those possibilities and the mechanics serve only to restrict or close or open up which paths they can walk down. For sure. The the mechanics are, at the end of the day, what it comes down to. If you're playing any sort of game module, or not, not game module, but game system, it is the system that tells your players what they can and cannot do. And a perfect example of one thing that your players can or hopefully don't do is the fact that, realistically, a fifth level party would be able to take over a town, right? Because there's only a few guards, and that's that end of story. So... In regards of that, let's say, if you have a group that decides that they want to take charge and cement their power, do you just let them walk over everyone? Because realistically, commoners are never going to be able to fight any level of adventures, and there's only so many guards. So it does that, I mean, hopefully that doesn't come up in most games, but undoubtedly it does come up. I've, I've, we've heard it for sure. We've heard that players take over towns and do whatever. So... Do you start fudging mechanics in that regard, or do you start, you know, or do you just leave it as is and hope that 
evolves into an awesome story. So there are two kind of mindsets here. The first is shit. My players are murder hobos. Uh, I'm going to start, you know, throwing bounty hunters and you know CR three veterans at them and that sort of thing. Um, and that's you know a valid way of looking at it. That's you know a way of punishing murder hobism. Um, but you know my personal take is you know I prefer to just kind of leave the world as is. Like it makes sense that a party of CR five PCs could storm into a random village and take it over. After all, that's literally what happens at the end of you know the Lord of the Rings. The, the PCs come back and find that a bunch of you know. Eighth level NPCs have stormed in and taken over their hometown, which has you know no defenses to speak of, and I think that kind of preserves the verisimilitude of the world. But beyond that, it you know, it doesn't really, in my opinion, damage the integrity of Crystal Strahd as an experience because Crystal Strahd is not a module defined by treasure or loot or experience points or monsters slain. Um, Crystal Strahd is a game of knowledge and social capital, um, and so the players can you know kill Bildrath in uh, Barovia and take all his stuff, but he's only got things on, you know, the, uh, you know, the uh, adventuring gear table. He doesn't have, you know, a, a plus three Vorpal Greatsword. Um, the players can, you know, kill Fiona Vokter, I guess, and take the Sun Sword out of her closet, but, you know, like, I mean, that's not the point of Crystal Strut, because once they have the Sun Sword, they still need to, you know, find a way to use it. Um, and part of the intent of the Turka readings is placing things in either really difficult or really accessible locations. Um, so like I said, you know, in terms of knowledge and social capital, if you're killing or threatening NPCs, A, they might not share information that you might want, and B, they're not going to help you. Curse of Strahd is, especially if you wind up confronting Strahd at a lower level, because, you know, you don't, not all campaigns or not all parties will confront Strahd at 10th level. Uh, and certainly with the Sun Sword and the Holy Symbol and even the Icon of uh, Ravenloft, a 7th or 8th level party is very capable of combating Strahd without being level 10. Uh, they can take him down. Um, so, but the thing about that is that Strahd also has means of opposing them. And a lot of the PC's ways of getting around Strahd's resources, of getting around Strahd's secrets, of getting around Strahd's uh, oppressive tactics is through the use of allies. Um, the, the Mardikovs and the Keepers of the Feather can provide incredible surveillance and espionage. Esmeralda can provide, and Van Richten can provide strategy, tactics, monster hunting lore, uh, backup in combat. Um, their, you know, foretold ally can provide, you know, resources or connections to others or inter intelligence or information uh, that a lot of others might not have available. Hell, even, you know, Piddlewick II can probably show the PCs around the castle because he knows where everything is. Um, and if you act in ways that alienate those uh, potential allies, even if they're not the foretold ally, you lose a lot of power and resources. I mean, to put it bluntly, in Curse of Strahd, the real treasure is the friends you make along the way. <laughs> and if you alienate those friends by, say, murdering Bildrath or, you know, staging a hostile takeover of Valaki or refusing to help the Marta Cubs or breaking down the gates of Kresk, you're going to alienate those allies and you're not you're going to cut off those resources. And I think, you know, certainly this merits at the start of the campaign, the DM sitting down and telling the PCs and the players, this is a social campaign. You know, you can act in reckless or, you know, selfish ways, but those way actions will have negative impacts on your relationships with other NPCs because, you know, at the end of the day, you want the players to understand that this is a, you know, if you've played, you know, Telltale games, it's that kind of game in the pure sense. If you, you know, attack, uh, you know, Erwin Mardikov to rob him, Irina Koliana is going to motherfucking remember that. Someone she might just walk this. away immediately. <laughs> um, you know, Ismark might not, might stop helping you. you. You will lose the services of a CR3 veteran. You know, Esmeralda might, you know, be a little warier of you. If you, you know, abandon the Mardikovs, they might abandon you. And that is a whole wealth of knowledge that you're losing. And, you know, obviously there are out of character ways to address players that are acting like jackasses, but in game, I think there are a lot of punishments for that that you know don't require throwing lots of big beady enemies at them. The game will resolve it for itself. Absolutely, and you know, obviously, it's not that you're punishing the player; it's that they are, you know, it, you know, they affect one thing, and something is affecting them. You know, you give what you get, yes. and mm -hmm. you get hit by you know a monster because you're <laughs> being an asshole 
So yeah, and I think you know part of that. That's part of why the communication is so important, and setting expectations and keeping those lines of communication open. Because I've seen a lot of DMs who get very frustrated with you know these murder hobo we players who just kind of charge in and do what they want and alienate people, and the players don't understand and they get frustrated when they feel like they're being punished. When the DM feels this is just you know realistically, if you beat up you know Davian Martikov, Davian's not going to help you, um, and. You know, I think it's very important for the players and the DM to be on the same page here. Um, because, you know, that in short will stop the whole thing from the start. Or at least will make sure that the players feel that, you know, if an NPC suddenly starts, you know, acting hostile to them, they'll feel that it's fair and deserved. Absolutely. Being transparent with the actions and reactions of the world around you is is very good because... You know, you don't don't blindside your players with you know certain in-game mechanics. Tell them up front, hey, if you are a bad person, bad things are going to happen to you. That's just what happens. It 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 makes sense. So we we talked about this murder hoboism, and murder hoboism doesn't necessarily mean you know just being an asshole to all of the PC or NPCs that are in towns or whatever. Murder hoboism can also go down to if your players are just walking around and they don't interact with the world as much as in detail as you want them to. For example, being, like you just said, that Revenant encounter. That Revenant encounter can be a wealth of information if they talk to said character, but they could just say, oh, see an undead, kill an undead. And the same thing could happen with every other random encounter. And it could happen with a lot of these set piece locations where they don't gleam any information at all. They just simply see that it you know there's a monster or some type of creature and they say hey let's go attack it roll initiative and that's that so is there a way you try to incorporate any sort of information in regards of that if your players see an enemy in fight or do you simply just let it run as is and just have the fight ensue and your players lose out on some permanent information in the campaign so i think the way that i would approach it is Let's say that I'm a new DM, right? Let's run a thought experiment. Uh, my players have just gotten to um, Argon of Astolt, and they uh, walk into the chapel, just kind of waltzing in there after. Because you know, when you look in, you can see the silhouettes of the revenants. Um, and they walk in, and the revenants uh, attack them, and the PCs, you know, fight to the death or whatever. Maybe a PC goes down or something, or maybe one of them dies, um, and you know, they kill the revenants. And the lesson they take from that is all revenants want to kill us. Then they go upstairs, they see Godfrey, and they immediately fucking attack God Godfrey, or they immediately attack Vladimir because you know they're undead and we got to kill them. And I think you know at this point, this is a moment where you know you need to stay very in tune with the lessons your players are taking. And this can be hard if your players are not people who role play a lot, because care if your players like to role play, your char your characters will enunciate the lessons they've learned. They'll say, "Oh well, I guess we can't trust undead anymore, can we?" <laughs> or "You should have just taken a shot from around the corner, shouldn't you?" Um, things like that. Um, but once you re once you get to a point where you realize that your players are just kind of acting, you know, off of the wrong lessons, I think it's important to step back, maybe even, um, maybe not pause the session, but, you know, plan and react to the lessons you think you're teaching them. Um, if, you know, you're between sessions, you know, it's perfectly fine to revisit a session zero and tell them, you know, Hi, this is how I'm running NPCs. Um, maybe you should be careful, but maybe you shouldn't attack on site. But maybe you should have backup plans, because you know, Curse of Strahd, where you know an enemy could all, or an unknown silhouette could be an enemy or a friend, but if you get too close to that enemy, they could just slaughter you. So I think Curse of Strahd is a module that rewards patience and caution on both sides of the equation, and you know, I think that's an understanding your PCs should have. And I think, you know, if you realize that they're taking the wrong lessons from it, um, I think it might be helpful to either talk to them out of character or to give them more reasons um, while not teaching them the wrong lessons. Um, for example, if, you know, one way that you might try to solve it that might not be as effective in the long run is you realize your players hate revenants, so you introduce a revenant, and the revenant immediately, you know, you know, throws down her arms and says, please don't fight me, I only wish to talk. Um, and the PCs are like, okay, let's talk to her. That you might feel like you've solved the problem, but all you've taught your PCs is if an NPC doesn't immediately surrender to you, you should kill them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are little subtle things that, you know, are all go into this big thing that we call the social contract of the game. And it's easy to miss them. And it's easy to, you know, try to 
patch over a small problem and create a bigger long-term pro problem in the course of things. And, you know, these are all complex issues that I don't expect, you know, new DMs or even intermediate DMs to, you know, easily recognize and solve on their own, even preemptively. Um, but again, this is part of what having that open line of communication is for. As soon as you get a whiff of something that might not be right, it's important to start that conversation, to start that dialogue. And don't accuse your players of playing wrong. Don't call them out. Don't make them feel uncomfortable. Just say, hi, I was surprised by this, or I felt uncomfortable, or I felt, um, you know, sad, or I felt that, you know, don't say, you know, you should have done this. Don't say you did this encounter wrong, but let them know how you felt about it. You know, what? let them know what you were going for and try to resolve that confusion because this is because of a miscommunication and these miscommunications need to be resolved. Absolutely. And a lot of the time it does come down to that miscommunication. A lot of times if I see something go down and my players react one way, after the session I'll go ahead and say, Okay, so what was your line of reasoning here? What was your motivation behind it? And what I always discover, practically every single time, is that I was putting down one thing, but my players were picking up something else. And, you know, that's just something you learn over time. You are going to learn what makes those individual players tick because, you know, this isn't a universal thing. This does come down to an individual case-by-case -case basis here. So, you know, just over time, you are going to pick up the things that your players are, you know, responding to. If you want, we keep talking about the, this undead thing. If your players have this mentality of see undead, kill undead, then you have to sit there and make them realize that there should be some type of rules of engagement. There should be an idea that there is these undead that are floating around here that aren't going to kill them on site. And maybe they, you know, if you do the whole surrender thing, then you are creating that larger issue. So you need to. And I think that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I Sure. I think like this is part of where the marks of horror come in. It's, you know, literally, I think page seven in the module and it's, you know, so often underused. And I've, you know, talked a lot about this in Reddit posts and videos on YouTube um, where if you are successful in making that social contract where scarier things are more dangerous, less scary things are less dangerous. Um, or you really focus on, you know, the foreshadowing and leaning into the unknown and you know, leaning into age and rot and fine detail to really play up the horror of dangerous things. If your players see something that doesn't look so dangerous, they're less likely to approach it with fear. And that is a very easy way of establishing that a very strong social contract up front with your players um, to make sure that you know, if nothing else, you can fall back back on you know that old reliable approach to make sure that you know you can direct and manipulate their perceptions as you as you believe best fits the game. Yeah, for sure. It's, you know, that session zero, it, it isn't just a session zero, it's a session forever. It, it, it is having that ta constant talk and, you know, just realizing what is going on here and sitting down, what makes your players tick. And, you know, it's not it's not always your players' fault, mind you. It, it could not, it's not anyone's fault, really. It is a combined effort. You are, we are group storytellers. We're all coming together and you know, saying some words, and then that's, those words become this amazing story. And, of course, we are human beings, and we all think differently, we act differently, and it's just important to consider what is everyone taking out of the adventure that you are all having. So, we've been talking about your players affecting the world and the engagement in the world, but what about, of course, Strahd? Because this guy is the namesake of this adventure. This guy is the big deal. What does Strahd do to affect the world around them? Does he kill NPCs? Does he destroy whole towns? Does he merely threaten people? Or is he just some tyrant that sits around in a castle and every once in a while visits the party in their bedtime, you know? How, how does Strahd impact the world around the players? So there are kind of two ways to interpret Strahd. There is the rules as written Strahd, and there's the kind of community creation of Strahd. Um, and I'll speak to the latter first. The community idea of Strahd is this kind of diabolical villain with, you know, these good social graces who is, you know, very goal-driven. He wants to, you know, win Irina, either, you know, either her love or her presence or, you know, uh, wed to her. He wants to, you know, um, you know, corrupt the PCs. Etc. Um, but you know, 
in that in this idea, Strahd is a very active antagonist. He is going to, you know, kidnap the PC's friends to torment them. He is going to try to spirit Irina away. He is going to disguise himself as, you know, Vasily von Holtz. Um, he's this very, you know, active, ever-present. He's almost like this kind of, not quite Team Rocket, but he obviously is a lot more dangerous than that. But he's this very flexible villain with a lot of irons in the fire and a lot of balls in the air at any one time because he's, you know, he's always got a scheme and he's always working on that scheme. So that's the community idea of Strahd, um, where, you know, those schemes may not always be antagonistic. They may not always be open. Um, Strahd might have, you know, more than one thing, you know, that he's trying to accomplish in a conflict or an encounter at one time that the players might not know about. But, you know, this kind of like generally complex active idea of Strahd as an antagonist. The as written idea of Strahd is this dark tyrant who enjoys causing pain and cruelty to uh, those of his domain and those who are subject to his whims. Um, the focus here is not on taking Irina. If you read the text closely, he actually doesn't take her as written until and unless the PCs are all dead. He doesn't spend his time on her because he's frankly not interested. He doesn't care about winning her love. He doesn't care about, you know, forcing the PCs to bow down to him. He's just there to, you know, break and test the PCs and just generally fuck with them and make them suffer. And, you know, to a certain extent, he has the same impact on the rest of Barovia where he is arriving for the Druid's ritual of Winter Splinter, where he orchestrates the uh, Feast of St. Andrew, um, not because he thinks that Irina is going to be, you know, be there, but purely because he wants to f you know, fuck with these people. He wants to make Velaki suffer more. He figures it's been 100 years since he was last there. He doesn't care if Irina is going to be there or not. He just wants to you know, make Velaki, you know, have a bad time um, because he is a tyrant who enjoys cruelty and enjoys suffering of those who he considers beneath them. And this is just a, you know, a fun way to show the PCs that Strahd is a bad dude. You know, obviously community content tries to make this more cohesive and make Strahd this very purpose, goal-driven villain. But as written, he's just this, you know, narcissistic, nihilistic sociopath who enjoys causing pain to others, um, you know, dressed beneath the veneer of civility. And I think, you know, it's kind of important to, if you're planning on running that aspect of him to keep that in mind, where, you know, Strahd is not going to kidnap the Marta Cubs. He's not going to, you know, burn the player's house down unless they're currently there. As written, Strahd is very limited in what he does. He shows up, he fucks with the PCs. He might have a few things going on out off screen. You know, I could certainly see, you know, Strahd organizing other things similar to the Feast of St. Andrew later on, but probably not because of the PCs. His goal is to directly test the PCs and to directly cause the PCs downfall. And, you know... Part of that is by the invitation he sends. Part of that is by luring them to Castle Ravenloft. Um, maybe things will accelerate to a certain climax from there, but I don't think it's inevitable by any means. So, you know, I think, you know, if you're ever toward this, you know, cohesive goal-driven Strahd, he's going to be a very active villain. He's going to be all over the place. He's going to have a lot of stuff going on, impacting not just the PCs, but the NPCs, uh, their safe havens, their relationships, their enemies. Uh, but the rules of written Strahd is, you know, much more limited. He's only going to show up when he wants to, and he's only going to show up to make the PCs have a bad time. So it depends on your preference and, you know, what kind of game you're going for. Absolutely. And you talked about it a little bit here, but Irina. Irina's sort of a focal point of the so-called story of this module. Once again, there is no true story of this module, but Irina is certainly one of the uh, the giant pins in the whole board here. So we meet Irina, and she's already been visited by Strahd twice. So why doesn't Strahd just get Irina whenever she wants? And more so to the point, is Irina actually safe in this world? Is there a reason why, other than the fact that Strahd's just an asshole? You know, he is a monster before he is a man. It's right there in the text. He is this guy who is being corrupted and has lived for hundreds of years. Is there a reason why, or is it just, you know, the method of his madness is that it's just madness? So one of my players in Twice Bitten, Serena, actually has a lot of good thoughts on this that she's, you know, uh, written a lot about, about, you know, Irina as a character um, and kind of her role in the story and how she's been treated by the writers and publishers of Curse of Strahd. Um, so I'll just kind of, you know, she's the expert, but I'll kind of, you know, take a little bit of what I've gleaned and what, uh, you know, I've discussed with members of the community. Because the asking of the question itself kind of assumes a lot of things that the authors of Curse of Strahd did not actually ask themselves. As, you know, the community has created this idea of Irina as this very foundational 
uh, core NPC whose story drives the module, whose Strahd seeks to, you know, win the affections of or spirit away or kidnap or, you know, this kind of central through line of the module uh, that in which she's very important and she has her own character, she has her own arc. And if you look at the actual text, none of that exists. Absolutely none of that is real. All of it is made up by the community. As written, Irina has two sentences describing her personality. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, she has, you know, a paragraph about Strahd's interest in her. Um, but, you know, Strahd makes it very clear that he doesn't care about Irina. He doesn't view her with romance or regret. In the text, Strahd only views Irina as the one that got away. And not in a sense of pining for her, but because he is a conqueror and he failed to conquer her. Therefore, as a point of pride, he must successfully conquer her again. Um, but Strahd is, as the module points out, very much, you know, distractible by new pleasures and entertainments. You know, he doesn't feel a need, you know, in, in 5e, and I should point out that 5e diverges from previous editions, where, you know, previous editions had, you know, Strahd aiming, you know, Tatiana and losing Tatiana every time she reincarnated was part of Strahd's curse and part of the torment that the Dark Powers condemned him to. In 5e, that's not present. None of that is. In 5e, Strahd doesn't care about Irina, you know, maybe he cared about her a hundred years ago, but certainly today, he doesn't care about Irina beyond just wanting to own her. And if she dies, he feels he'll get her eventually. So he's in no rush to get there. And he's focused on the PCs, not on Irina. He doesn't want to waste the effort on her because, again, he doesn't care about her as a person. And as a result, Irina gets very short shrift in the actual text. Like I said, she gets, you know, two lines of personality description. She, uh, you know, I think is, the book says, you know, she is polite but has a strong will. And that's like, that's all you get. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You, know, you don't really get anything else. Ismark gets more than her. <laughs> he, you know, apparently wants to hunt Strahd all his life. He gets like a whole paragraph. Irina gets a sentence and a half. Um, and Irina is, you know, it's kind of core part for the module for a lot of people. So as written, Strahd could take her, but he doesn't want to. He doesn't care. She's not a motivating factor for him. He's not interested in her suffering. He's interested in the PC suffering. Because I think something important to note is that, you know, if you look at the module, there's this important little line of text that is very, you know, eye-opening, which is, A, 90% of Barovia has no soul. And B, Strahd gains no sustenance from dr drinking the blood of a soulless. You can kind of expand this. Uh, looking at Strahd's, you know, character introduction in the uh, first chapter of the module, Strahd finds the PCs interesting and entertaining, uh, looking to see if they can be a consort or a successor, but they will inevitably fail to live up to his expectations and he will lose interest in them and decide just to kill them cruelly in tormenting ways. Strahd loses interest. Irina is not interesting to Strahd. He doesn't care about her. He's not interested in her. She is just a trophy for him to pick up when he feels like it. And for now, he's actually interested in engaged with the PC. So as long as they're on the table, he's going to focus on them. I'll worry about Irina later. Obviously, community content is not satisfied with that. <laughs> I was not satisfied that, with that with Reloaded. Mandy was not with, you know, fleshing out. And the community as a whole has, I think, very loudly spoken, saying, Irina got dealt a really bad hand rules as written, and we find her character a lot more interesting, and we think she deserves more, and the module deserves more of a through line through her arc. Um, and that's perfectly valid, literally. Again, my Reloaded Guide expands on this a lot, and part of what I'm working on in my Berez chapter right now that I hope to publish soon um, is all about, you know, what does that lead to? What is the culmination of Irina's arc? Where does her character go? And if you're focusing on... Irina's arc, you're also focusing on Strahd's relationship with her as it builds over time. Uh, is he trying to woo her? Is he trying to fool her through his disguise as Vasily? Um, is he trying to be civil to, civil to the PCs to, you know, win Irina's affection secretly? Or, you know, is he trying to gaslight her or drive her to Castle Ravenloft by taking away all of the other support networks she has? And so I think there are a lot of interesting things you can do with that, that focus on Strahd's relationship with Irina. Um, but so it really depends on where you want to take it. Because Irina, you know, in Rules is written, I think there's a lot of depth you have to work to give her to make her journey to the pool, you know, or to Sorge at the end interesting. Um, or just things that you can tweak, such as, you know, maybe she doesn't go to the pool, maybe she, you know, leaves Barovia at the end because she wants to see the world outside. Um, so there are a lot of directions that you can take that. Um, and I think it ultimately comes down to how foundational do you want Irina's plotline to be in the story? And... Do you want the PCs to feel safe? 
Do you want the pieces to feel like they can just drop Irina off and just not have to worry about Strahd anymore? Because you could do that. And if you do that, if Strahd's only were focused on Irina, they're not going to feel threatened by Strahd. They'll, you know, feel sympathetic for their friend Irina. But if they don't like Irina, they'll just, you know, dump her the first chance they get because she attracts danger and they'll go off and do their own thing. Alternatively, if you have Strahd interested in the PCs instead of Irina, that mounts up the tension. It means that, you know, Irina can be, you know, left behind or brought along without too much of an impact while, you know, developing that relationship. And at the same time, you know, it means that the players will feel an actual connection to Strahd and an actual reason to kill Strahd if Madame Ava has not already told them to. Because as I mentioned like an hour ago, unless you start off with the mysterious visitor's hook, the PCs have no reason to get a reading from Madame Ava. Yeah. They have no reason to kill Strahd except from the antagonism he provides. And if you pin a lot of that arena, it might be a lot more satisfying from a character and, you know, kind of a thematic aspect. But as a matter of psychology and gameplay, if you make Irina the target of Strahd's pursuit, that means that the PCs won't feel pressured and they won't feel opposed to Strahd. So it's a balancing act. You have to do it carefully and you have to make sure that if you make Irina his target up front, you have to very carefully account for the PCs and slowly manipulate the PCs such that eventually they grow to a point where they cannot do anything except oppose Strahd openly. And that's a difficult thing to do over time, but you know it might be worth it if you want to give Irina her due. Absolutely. And that whole, you know, concept of making Irina one fleshed out and two giving her a satisfying ending does play a lot into this campaign of is Irina a very, very big part of the campaign? Because if she is practically attached to the hip of the party throughout the entirety of the module, then you definitely want to make sure that it is worthwhile giving her a satisfying conclusion. And speaking of conclusions, I think we're going to wrap up today's video with one last question here of can your players actually make this world a better place or are they doomed to make this land always worse? Because throughout the entirety of the module, Strahd is presumably making their lives miserable and because they are actively opposing Strahd, Strahd is, you know, going out of his way to ruin everything and make them look bad. But is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Is Barovia saved? And by the end of it, if they kill Strahd, is there a way to finally, you know, release all of the terribleness that is going on around these lands? So in community... Exp so let me start with Rules as Written. Um, rules as Written, the players are not doomed to make the land worse, but they're not going to make Barovia a better place. They might free Irina, uh, which is one good thing, but in the long run, Strahd will return. Strahd will reconquer Barovia. It will fall under his sway once more. Um, and, you know, obviously this is not kind of a lasting happy ending. But I think this kind of plays, you know, into the point of Curse of Strahd and a lot of the horror genre as a whole, especially gothic horror, um, where this idea of the horror story not is not a place to be, you know, permanently conquered, but as a crucible or a forging ground, or a teaching experience for the characters that undergo its trials. Um, if you look at the standard horror story, um, you know, the characters go through it all, they, you know, defeat the ghost at the end, there's like a jump scare where the ghost isn't really dead, where the killer <laughs> is still alive. Um, but the important thing is that the main characters made it out alive, you know, scarred, um, haunted, um, but wiser. And, for example, coming back to Castlevania, if you look at, you know, the um, the Netflix adaptation, uh, the plot arc with uh, Dracula is basically such that if you look at, say, Trevor uh, Belmont up front, he begins as kind of this drunkard, uh, shamed heir of this dead monster hunting family that's viewed with, you know, ridicule and loathing and, uh, you know, antisocial. And through the course of the experiences he undergoes, he becomes the heir to heroism that his house was always meant to foster. Um, in a ghost story, uh, a traditional horror story, uh, the I forget what, I think it might have been Insidious 3 that I saw. I didn't see the first ones, but I remember there was like a, a medium who like, you know, goes to the house uh, that's haunted with spirits and ghosts, and she conquers the ghost and finds someone, you know, personal to her. And, you know, there are trials and tribulations and, you know, there are still demons around, you know, there are still dark things, but she comes out of that experience wiser and better able to be the person that she was meant to be. 
So that's one way to look at it, where, you know, Brovia is full of soulless husks anyway. Strahd is always going to come back. But you, the PC, became the hero you were always meant to be. And that's the important part. You didn't make the land a better place because the land doesn't matter. The land is just a, t a, a, a canvas where you can paint yourself. And what matters is how you, the experiences and the lessons you walk away with. That's obviously unsatisfying to a lot of people. <laughs> um, a lot of people don't play this for, you know, you know the, tre the treasure we made was the lessons we learned. Like, no, people don't want that. People want treasure. They want, you know, big victories. They want to bring light back to the land. They want to feel good about the lasting impact they'll have. That sort of thing. And that's completely valid. That's why a lot of community content um, has come in to fill the gaps. That's why you see, you know, Lunch Break Heroes coming in. And I think, uh, you know, talking about, you know, binding Vampyr and uh, severing Strahd's connection to the land. That's why you see a lot of people talking about, you know, making deals with the Dark Powers and replacing Strahd over Barovia so that, you know, the Barovians can go free. That's why you see people talking about, you know, uh, um, adding in the Fanes. That was why I created the Fanes in the first place in my original Curse of Strahd campaign, because I wanted a way for the pieces to be able to complete extra trials in order to free Barovia from the oppression of the Shadow forever. And the PCs loved that. They felt good about it. There were still threats. There was still darkness out there. But they made Barovia better. They brought the light back. And they really liked that. And I think, you know, this is a matter of knowing yourself and knowing your players. Are your players going to be okay with, you know, watching a horror movie? Or do they want, you know, The Witcher? Where, you know, it's dark and it's grueling and it's gritty. But at the end of the day, Geralt comes home and the world, or at least his friends, are better because of what he's done. And, you know, I would say the vast majority of players and DMs want, you know, dark fantasy where you can win the end of the day and it, the victory lasts versus, you know, a gothic horror, survival horror, where this, the, the goal is surviving and escaping as opposed to changing the world. So obviously I think a lot of DMs might be tempted toward, you know, the horror aspect just because they like the trappings of it. But I would say be careful. Know what you want, know what your players want, and always be willing to revisit those assumptions uh, midway or even late in the campaign if you think that your players might not be satisfied with the ending. Absolutely. This ending is usually, you know, a long time in the coming. You know, your players are playing through this module and however many sessions it takes, whether it be in the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, however many sessions it takes, giving your players an ending well-deserved is important because, yes, of course, we remember the journey way more than the destination, but the destination needs to at least deliver. And that is something that is always hard for most people is giving a satisfying ending and whatever it be movies, TV shows, video games, D and D endings are always hard to pull off. But thankfully, you know, once again, use that community around here, ask them what is the best solution. And obviously every single person's game is going to be different. And that is why you need to rely on everyone else to forge that perfect ending. And speaking of endings, I think this is probably a decent time to wrap up because I could sit here and talk to Dragna all day, but he's probably got way more important things to do than just talk to me. So we're probably going to end it around here. So thank you so very much for coming on and talking to me about all, talking to me about all this Curse of Strahd stuff because it's absolutely fascinating to me. There is just so much to dive into with this module. We only scratch the surface of what can be found in here. So yeah, just go ahead and uh, go ahead and start expounding yourself. Tell me all your links and tell me all the things that you want to shout out to the heavens uh, so that we can get everyone in on what you've got to sell. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, first off, thank you again so much for having me on. Um, if any of you are interested, um, I know that, you know, I published my Curse of Strahd Reloaded guide on the subreddit. Again, don't just look at my guide. There are so many good materials there. Lunch Break Heroes, Mandy Mod, Guild's Bounty. There is a rogues gallery of fantastic content creators that I encourage you and urge you to check out. Again, that's reddit.com slash r slash Curse of Strahd. Um, I also encourage you to check out the Discord, which you can access via the sidebar on the Reddit. It's a wonderful community with a lot of resources and a lot of people who can help you run your game. Um, we answer questions. We've got, I think, 3,000 DMs in the server now, uh, like 800 active um, and a routine cast. 
And, you know, it's a really, really great community. So first off, just want to plug that. They are fantastic folks and can be a fantastic resource to you if you're looking into Curse of Strahd. Um, beyond that, I know that I mentioned a lot about rules as written interpretations of Curse of Strahd um, and kind of running the module um, as written or doing your best to run like a faithful adaptation. If you find that interesting or if you're interested kind of a Curse of Strahd, you know, run by a DM or a Curse of Strahd in a very role play character focused sense, uh, I am running uh, Curse of Strahd Twice Bitten. It is a ongoing um, Curse of Strahd rules as written playthrough uh, with a bit of a unique twist. The five players are all current or former Curse of Strahd DMs. So they know the module, but they don't know what I'm planning, though I am running it as written, because they haven't seen every wrinkle. And there, it's a very character-driven campaign. The central question is, can the PCs, who are not heroes, but cowards and um, you know thieves and others who might be more selfish than selfless, how do they react, how do they develop, and how do they grow in Curse of Strahd? It's, it's very much a focus on that Barovia as a crucible idea. And if you think you might be interested in that kind of, you know, character-driven horror experience, um, we you can find us on uh, YouTube. A full episode playlist um, is at tinyurl.com slash twicebitten. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash r curse of Strahd. Uh, which is also the YouTube channel for the Curse of Strahd subreddit. We have a bunch of fireside chats and other things with Curse of Strahd content creators. And um, uh, if you're looking to catch Twice Spitten live, we uh, air live on Twitch every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, uh, though we are taking a bit of a break uh, over Thanksgiving and for a few weeks uh, over Christmas. But if you decide to give it a watch, maybe that'll give you time to catch up. Uh, but it's been a really rewarding experience uh, getting to explore the module as written. And yeah, I think it's really fascinating. So thank you again to No Fun Allowed for having me on to talk at excruciating length about this <laughs> module that I've probably dumped way too much time into over the past four years. I'm sure some people would argue it's not enough, but who is counting really? Uh, thank you so very much for everyone that watched or at the very minimum listened because I doubt too many people are sitting here staring at the screen. But thank you so very much. Thank you to Dragon Carta. Thank you all for these awesome people that make this community fantastic because the Curse of Strahd community is the most active community. You guys are great. And that is going to do it for me on this one. Thank you so very much for watching. And I cannot wait to see you all in the next one.